Sneaker lovers have reason to celebrate. You know who said that? Forbes magazine said that. Do you know who they said it about? Greats.com. Greats sneakers. That's who they said it about. My boys, Ryan Babenzine and John Buscemi, besides having two of the coolest fucking names in the history of life, started this sneaker company because they wanted to bring something different, disruptive, and better to the sneaker market, and they did it. They're from Brooklyn. We love that. They sell sneakers. We love that. But what we really love is how cool, comfortable, stylish, and fresh these sneakers are. They're changing the game. From a business point of view, it's brilliant because they have what's called a disruptive business model. They're disrupting the industry. So what does that mean, right? You look at the major sneaker brands out there, and it takes them 18 to 24 months to design, create, produce, and bring a new product to market. That means that right now, they're working on stuff that's coming out around 2020. Stop it. Stop it. Greats does that in less than four months. Product after product after product after product. Look at my foot. Look at my foot, Bruno. You know what that is? That's the all-leather Royale lace-up. Look at that. Oh, it's beautiful. Mike Rick is wearing the Wooster slip-on. We will bury you in awesome footwear right now. It's the perfect gift for the holidays. Save 15% on your first purchase with the code 3PLT. That's the number 3, PLT, at greats.com. We love these guys. Greats.com, they've been featured in Vogue, Esquire, GQ, Entrepreneur, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Complex, Mashable, Bloomberg Business Week, Hype Beast. Hype Beast said that Greats is shaping the footwear industry one model at a time. Slam X Hype says that you have to rethink the idea of men's footwear. Maxim, Four Pins, Valet, Uncrate. Go to Greats.com. We love these guys. You're going to love them. You're going to love these sneakers. Okay, Bruno, stop everything. I want to talk about the enclosed. You don't want two, one, two, three, four. What's the enclosed, you ask? Well, it's just the greatest fucking product that ever existed in the history of mankind. EnclosedLingerie.com E-N-C-L-O-S-E-D Lingerie.com High-end designer lingerie sourced from around the world. Fellas, you know it's coming, right? You know it's coming. Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, President's Day, Birthday, Earth Day, Dog Day, Tuesday, Anniversary, One Day Anniversary, Ten Day Anniversary, Three Month Anniversary, Twelve Week Anniversary, Six Month Anniversary, Ten Year Anniversary of the thing that was special that you don't remember, but you act like you remember because you don't want her to lose her mind, well, you're going to have to buy her a gift. Don't get her another sweater. Surprise her. Do something smart, you dimwit. Give her the gift that keeps on giving because Enclosed sends out a new gift every month. You just sit back and she enjoys the surprises month after month. Do you understand the concept of what I'm telling you? It's high-end teddies, robes, and lingerie every month on a subscription basis. It's kind of like beer of the month, flower of the month, except sexy, beautiful, high-end lingerie of the month that you're responsible for. You made this happen. You're the hero. You are the hero. Do you understand what I'm telling you? And these aren't like department store undies. These aren't like the bloomers you get at Target. These aren't Target bloomers, fellas. High-end designer lingerie from around the world. Go look at Cherry Brandy and tell me if that doesn't change your life. So what do you do? You go to EnclosedLingerie.com, you open up an account, and then you customize your preferences based on your wife or girlfriend, and then they send it every month. They guarantee the size, too. You can't mess it up. They get the fit right 98% of the time. That's unheard of. Hey, thanks for the advice, TJ, but how many people are using them? Shut your filthy hole. Thousands and thousands of men and women love enclosed. Thousands. So stop everything that's happening in your life. Go to EnclosedLingerie.com, EnclosedLingerie.com, and don't forget to use the code 3PLT for $20 off your order at EnclosedLingerie.com. This is a game changer. Greatest thing that ever happened to the human race. It's the sexiest gift on earth. Welcome to Three People Like This Interviews. And now, a man who should be on some sort of fucking watch list, TJ Stone. I've been uh, tweeting uh, and responding to the president of the United States, Donald Trump. I don't know if you have you heard of him. Yeah, douche. Right. Yeah, well, he's a he's a he's a big tweet guy, and uh, he keeps me posted on a lot of the stuff that's going on. Yeah, you know, I have access to him. He's a uh, I don't really like to brag, but you know, Donald and I tweet to each other. Is this my mic? Yeah, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Nothing better than the president of the United States tweeting about Levar Ball. Nothing. No, that's, I mean, that's a crazy story, man. I mean, LeVar Ball. I mean, you know, you know, if hey, you had, just if you, lean but, back, you could pull this like this. Look, this bends. See, grab the top right here. 
Is See, this... and if you just pull it, there you go. You get to play with it a little bit. Ooh, awesome. Then you can relax. Like, like a gentleman. I feel like I'm on Mike and Mike or something. Yeah, except not. No, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because you could tell that those guys deal with the mic so much. They had a they had a guest on there, some football dude, and he didn't know how to handle the mic. And um, yeah, and, and uh, Golik was like, "Hey, you want just go ahead and grab that mic over there and just put it to your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> just go, ease up on the mic, there, buddy. Ease up on the mic. You know. Um, yeah, yeah. That, but I mean, the var ball. If you ask me, the thing about that is, I mean, look, no matter. How, no matter if you what if you like the guy you don't like the guy dude his kids could be in jail still for 10 years yeah right you know so you gotta you gotta give credit look if 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 lucifer himself did a favor for me i would say hey thanks devil well that's the thing see that's how overpower uh, overpoweringly douchey trump is is that you forget that the kid did a bad thing he yes. makes himself look so bad. Yeah, well, because he responded, right? I mean, he has no, he has no tact. He's no, just a fucking bull. There's no regalness. He, and, and, you, thank you. You know, that's the thing you want your president. Thank being you. Like, that's the word, regalness. There's no regalness to him. You know, he's like a, a frat dude who somehow walked himself into the presidency. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, if you think about it, I mean, it's, it's it's the greatest thing in the world to watch, Doug. It's the greatest thing in the world to watch. It's like an episode of South Park. It, it is. We're man, living in an episode of South Park. It is an absolute train wreck, and we're, we've got. Front row seats, and um, we're just and thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we're just like I mean, I mean, it's it's really what it's crazy how that's what the presidency the presidency has become now. But um, I honestly, and you know, I read a book a while back about that. A guy named um, Fareed Sakar, he wrote a great book about the future of politics. And this was about ten years ago, and he talked about the people who are going to become president. And this is when George. Uh, second Bush was president. He said that the people who are going to start becoming president and and political power are the ones who are more socially recognized in the media because it's going to be so hard to raise. So money. he saw this coming. Yeah, he saw it coming. He said that pe- basically the birth of the the beginning of Arnold Schwarzenegger being governor, where everybody's like the governor, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger being yeah. the governor. Yep. That was the beginning because he says unless people know who you are, you can't raise the money. So, so the more presence you have through media, through whatever it is, you know, reality TV show, movies, it's going to be celebrities are going to have the leverage to run for political office because they they can raise so much money so fast because everybody knows who they are. Who and they he's are. the perfect storm. He's the perfect storm of celebrity and money, wasn't he? Yeah, no, he came out of nowhere. And but I always, but I always thought like that. There's this power structure in place. Maybe naively, I thought that there's a power structure in place that will never allow someone to be the president unless they want him to be. Maybe, maybe that's not so true. Maybe that was me believing in conspiracies or like you know, like the yeah. like there's powerful families like you people let run the you government, know, like the, fed, just, the fed, Federal Reserve and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I just did a reading with Craig Lucas, and he was directing the whole thing, and he. As beautiful as a writer as he is, man, he's very conspiracy theory guy. Greg Lucas is a writer. Craig Lucas. He, he Craig wrote. Lucas, yeah. He wrote. Um, a if, Prelu- if Prelu- Bruno or Mike were here, they they would know who that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, he's a big theater guy. I mean, right. he wrote he wrote Prelude to the Kiss, which is a play which was turned into a movie. Right. With Alec Baldwin and I remember that. Um, I don't remember that, but Nick. I'm just saying I remember that. Though. <laughs> it's good. You're talking to a complete dimwit caveman. I have a Beastie Boys shirt on. I'm 49. I, I just yeah, want I like, to put that out there I, real I quick. I was listening to Beastie Boys on the way up here. There you go, my man. Which one? What were you listening to? I was listening to the classic one, man. Which one? Oh, uh, license to ill. License to ill. Uh huh. What song? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Imagine if I know what song. How how many minutes it is? Three minutes and thirty four seconds. Uh, shoot the thrill. Yeah, shoot the thrill. <laughs> yeah, that that was the one that they. Oh, said. Wait a minute, that's ACDC. <laughs> no, wait a minute. Oh, so close. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you called it "Shoot to Thrill" <laughs> as a Beastie Boys song. I was gonna play along and let people think that that was a Beastie Boys song. Yeah. Obviously, it's not. No, uh, it's license not. to ill. Is that because it sounded like license to ill? So you said shoot to yeah, thrill. Yeah, I was like uh, right. uh, shoot to ill thrill. Right thrill. now, the important thing that you were talking about that was related to the good writer. Say that thing that you wanted to say that I interrupted you on. <laughs> no, it's Craig Lucas. No, it's too late. It's gone. It's gone. No, 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 you got to tell me. No, but he was like, uh, I mean, you know, when you meet conspiracy people, people, yep, like, and you're like, hmm. That's interesting. I mean, it's so deep the what? conspiracy theory. Oh, okay, that you're like, what did he have? What was well, he, he believes in, the, and he he says that there's this group. I forgot the name of the group. There's this political group that they dictate. They don't even they allow who's going to become in power. That's what I thought. I I would believe that. And he, and I forgot was, what that wasn't the Illuminati. It was something like the Illuminati. Yes. 
Oh, it was he, the Illuminati? Illuminati. And he went on <laughs> and on. About the Illuminati. And he went on. And he basically said that um, they have so much power, kind of like, you know, you remember the story here about when, uh, you know, apparently uh, skulls and bones, I think from, is he, I think it's in Yale where apparently. Yeah, skull and bones, yeah. Skull and bones, people believe that gate. And that these this really elite fraternity in Yale is basically who controls the world. Like, you know, yeah. and they were saying like, you know, uh, John Kerry was part of it. Bush was part of it. I mean, it's just like, it's just this really elite. I, I don't people. like to talk about it, but I was involved a little bit. But you look like a skull and bone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was, when I walked in, I was like, oh, that's that skull and bone. I, I look like that's what's in my closet, yeah. but I don't look like I was part of the actual group. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like when you meet conspiracy people, like it's so deep. You're like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost believable. Yeah. It's, it's almost believable, but it's also like. Makes sense. Well, no, I, I'm no like, I, I could no. To me, it's just like it doesn't make sense. Oh, it I'm doesn't like, make sense. I'm like, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't. But that doesn't make any sense to me, you know. But it's so, and people believe this stuff so deeply. Yeah. I mean, he and he was one of them. Like, you know, you meet people who talk about, like, you know, I'll talk about skull and bones, but I don't know anything about it. But then you meet people who believe in this stuff, and they're just like, and he's well studied on it, well yeah, versed. He knows well-versed, everything yeah, about I mean, it. He's all of a sudden talking about, you know, basically yeah. they're controlling the world, yeah. and, and they're going <laughs> to yeah. dictate what's going to happen in the next twenty years. You know, and you're like, well, listen, guys, if you're listening, we could use a little boost, uh, <laughs> maybe a new studio in Manhattan. That would be great, you know, man. If and Golden Bones is around, we'd you know. be happy to advertise for you. you yeah, <laughs> we would give him a good rate on advertising. That's what I, you know, my friend up Frim and I, who comes and does the show with me, we always do the uh, the Illuminati network. Like if they had a radio show, you know, yeah. Like I wish, I like it might get to the point where they like Skull and Bones. They're not so secretive anymore, and they just start advertising. Like brought to you by Skull and Bones, secret organization <laughs> that runs the world. <laughs> do you need a president? We will give you one. <laughs> <laughs> you know do you need a powerful secretive infrastructure well contact us at 1-800 right skull and bones but you know what's crazy about donald trump is is you ever watch vice yeah, yeah. i like vice and vice had a whole episode about uh, they were talking they had they were interviewing some technological some technology company that apparently was analyzing why trump won and how social media played a huge part in it and they were doing all these analytics and they had this like big ball this like white like little bunch of lines kind of like you would see in you know you know that graph when you see planes traveling flying yeah. in the air okay, yes so they had a thing like that and it was basically about social media and it had a huge white one on black matter right white all these white lines when going to white dots and it's bigger and they had this little red one and the white uh, represented uh, uh democrats and and liberals and the red one represented uh conservatives and, okay and so what they were saying is that on the big white one was basically democrats and it was like three times the size of the red room of the Republican conservative one. But what was fascinating was that no one in the Democrat side or the liberal side of this graph was communicating to any Republicans. Yeah. An echo chamber. It was an echo chamber. Exactly. And, and, and that was the biggest part. And, and it's, it's something that I, I listen to. And what's been fascinating by doing my show is that when you meet people in the middle of the country, you see, when you go like to Hayes, Kansas, where I was, like I tell uh, my like Democrat friends, like until you go to Hayes, Kansas, you don't understand why Donald Trump won. That's right. Right. When you're here, you're like it's a it's a it's a it's a, crust, it's a clusterfuck. You know, it's, you're it's, like it's yes. mind boggling <clears throat> sure. until you go yep. to somewhere where he won. Like it's all red. You know, and, I, and I'm from Texas. I had no idea how red Kansas was. You don't know. Yeah. All that all that in be- that area in between L.A. and New York is America. Right? It's America. And I try to uh, explain this to my like raging liberal friends. You know, I have friends on both ends of the spectrum. I'm very like sent. I'm very like I don't believe in looking at everything from one point of view. You just can't. You just can't do it. It's crazy because I mean, I do the play and I do play in big cities and I do them in small cities. Yeah. And- by the way, uh it's about 12 minutes in and I haven't even introduced you yet. Oh, sorry. That's the different <laughs> groundbreaking stuff we do in this show. No, it's great. Skull Doug, and Bones, It's dude. Skull and Bones, buddy. It's Skull and Bones. Thank you. Three people like this interview is brought to you by Skull and Bones, <laughs> the secret organization that runs everything. And we'll give you a president. Go to SkullandBones.com. <laughs> you go to SkullandBones.com and a fist reaches out and punches you in the throat no you probably the moment you get on the website you probably hear a knock on your front door or you just your face gets scanned and they have you in a database immediately yeah you know yeah. They, no they, I'm, <laughs> it's two guys in dark black suits like men in black show up at your front yeah. door and say 
We noticed you web, you visited our website. <laughs> Uh, I just did like two minutes ago. Are you friends with Douglas Torrell? 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 No, not him. <laughs> <laughs> no, so we should introduce you okay. a little bit. Uh, this is becoming a signature of mine. I don't introduce my guests until about five, six hours into the uh, into the thing, too. It's groundbreaking. This is what we call groundbreaking. It's right? funny. But, um, I mean, I, I'm i funny because I want to go back to when you were a kid. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to get, when I think of, what you're doing now, I want to set the stage a little bit of like where you came from, you know? Like me or you? You, not me. Me, I'm a <laughs> pile of garbage. Well, you're from Brooklyn, With right? a mouth on it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I always, cons- I'm from Texas and I always thought Houston, that- Texas? Houston, Texas. I know, because you wore the Astros hat in. Yeah. Was- Very happy that they won the uh, uh, World Series. Let me tell you, dude, I deserve it, man. I- I've been through a lot of misery in my life. And you've been an Astro fan your whole life yeah. because that's where you're from, right? I, I remember eight, the 86 Mets. That's I- refreshing. Hold on, by the way, to meet a guy who's from a place and roots for that team. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't happen too well, often. It's, it's only nice because they won <laughs> right now. <I> mean, <laughs> right. They well, lost. it's cool that you're a fan. It's nice to see, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean... I- it, no, it's nice to see a fan from that place get a, a championship. Yeah. No, it was... I mean, dude, it was like... I mean, we were... Amazing. Oh, it was you amazing. weren't supposed to win that World Series. You, you want to know how sick I am about it? How? In the victory. I was watching the World Series last night that I recorded. <laughs> oh, you were watching it again? I had again? a buzz. I had a drink on it. My wife you goes, watched it again. I watched it again. My wife, goes, for you, my wife was like, what are you doing? Because I'm watching the game. She goes, you're like, you're hilarious. No, listen, I am a Steelers fan, obviously, right, from way back. And uh, when they won the Super Bowl, my son was just born. It was like the fifth one that they won. And... I <laughs> I didn't have a deep, you know, at that time there was no DVRs. There was like, you know, I recorded everything on DVDs. I had a DVD that would record. It was a big deal for me. Like you buy the DVDs, but you can record as you watch it. So I ran yeah. the signal through the DVD. I, wa- I recorded the Super Bowl. I recorded ESPN's reaction to it afterwards. I recorded the NFL Network. <laughs> I recorded the next day's episodes of as ESPN. See? And I recorded the uh, the um, the parade from Pittsburgh. <laughs> now, that's the only thing I didn't record is the parade. But I'll tell you what I did do. You probably didn't do. <laughs> so uh, I collect baseball cards, and I've been doing that forever. I don't do it as much as I used to as a kid, but when I was a kid, I was really into it. Are you it. still into it? Is there value to it, or is it just... Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a hobby, but is there still value to it? I mean, it? I, I always say this. Which is, people blow their mind, but I blow their mind when I say this. I have probably close to twenty thousand dollars in baseball cards. Twenty thousand? Yeah, like I have Ricky Henderson's rookie. I have Bo Jackson's rookie. I have Ricky Henderson's rookie. How, how much? Would Ricky it go Henderson's for? rookie right now. You could probably get two grand for it. So that's that's so twenty grand. You have, have more than twenty grand worth. No, because I have a lot of. You shit. spent twenty grand, or you think it's worth about twenty grand? No, I if I had if I grabbed all my baseball cards that I have right now, I could probably buy. An SUV. Yeah, well, you probably. It sounds like it'd be more than that. I mean, no. Because if, if one no, card is two thousand, oh, so it's not that. It's it, like no, one because, card is the rare. Like that's the rarity. Yeah. That, so you know, it depends on the depends on the player, and also yeah. depends on the card. So and, like, and the market too. Well, like Bo Jackson. So they, when Bo Jackson came out, they made two rookie cards for him. They made a football card, and right? They, and they made a baseball. Yeah, because he card. played both sports. He played both sports. Right. His football, his baseball card is more valuable than his football card. Now you say why? Why? Because everybody really remembers how badass of a runner he was, not much of a baseball player, but because the car that they made of him, they made him going up the wall. So it's like this iconic image of Bo Jackson going up on the wall, and they all and they made it with a um, uh, making a catch up on the wall. They made a a, a live pr- shot, a printing mistake on it. When they went up on it, they somehow they they they. The ball is messed up on the image. Oh, so it's like this. It's it's juxtaposed to where yes, it's supposed to be. Exactly. The ball is not where it's supposed to be. So it's become this iconic Bo Jackson shot where it's like almost supernatural what he's doing. Isn't that funny? So the card is worth more. So that's what happens with these things. Like there's the card. Wasn't there a famous card where on the knob of the bat, there was a. Do you remember that? There was a, a famous card where the guy, his teammates had wrote, written like fag. On the knob of the bat. Th- that I don't yeah, know. Yeah, so I'm going to look it up. That and, I don't it, know. and it made it through, or they wrote something horrible and on it, it. And no one saw it. Nobody it saw up. it. Right. Nobody saw it, and and it got printed, and then it became a rare card because they discontinued the printing. So I used to collect. I mean, I'm going to look it up. I, I mean, I collected everything. So right when the Astros won, I know how it works. <laughs> yeah. Tom, yeah. You, you know how this goes, right? So Top said, 
every so they did one for the American League Championship and they did one for the World Series entering the World Series and then so what what baseball cards do to control the limit right it's just like it's almost like a stock they produce yeah. only a very limited amount so the value right. goes up really high right 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 so they said right away right after the World Series the for only 24 hours after they won the World Series they were going to make this limited edition baseball card set and okay. after after 24 hours it's gone right cuz they know that Bunch of people are going to buy it who are nuts, right. and then after that, after you get don't don't get it now, but go ahead, go ahead, yeah. just leave it there for a second, and then then the value goes up. So I immediately went online, <laughs> and like I knew, right? I got on tops. I was like, Boop. did I they bought. have it? How quickly is it available? Well, you can't get them anymore now. No, but how quickly after they win the World Series is it the immediate? Immediate. In wow. fact, it's so immediate. The market is so intense that tops takes out promotional. They do a like a commercial. They pay the the MLB to do announcers, and they'll like you know they're talking baseball like me and you, and they'll say, and by the way, MLB just came out with the limited edition baseball card set from the Houston Astros winning. You have twenty four hours to get it, and oh, like wow. and they pay for it. So they that's know pretty. That, that's pretty funny. So they and that's the ju- market, and it's it's just guys like you. So there's enough people like you to drive the market. Yeah, exactly. That's what happens, and there's baseball card nuts, and so. So you got it immediately. So going to, I don't know how fucking we're going all over the yeah, place. Yeah, it's good. We should probably talk about, I don't know. No, my, I'll edit it my, back in. Don't worry about my it. My horoscope. Yeah. Horoscope. Okay. Horoscope. Horoscope. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, like, we're going to talk I, about I, it. But I thought Texas and Brooklyn are so similar. In what way? Well, because in Brooklyn, you know, Brooklyn has the reputation of like, you get your ass kicked if you say the wrong thing to yeah. the wrong person. Right? Well, it used to be, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Now I know. I know. Now, like, now you get ostracized on social media. Social media, or yeah. you get, or you get sued. <laughs> yeah. Or you, or you're not. A, or I think they take away your bike lane privileges for a couple <laughs> yeah. days. That's the worst that happens yeah. in this godforsaken fucking yeah. place. Yeah. No, I exactly. miss the old Brooklyn. No, I, I do too. Man. I do, I but I don't. I, I mean, you know. I, 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 get, I know what you're saying, dude. I, mean, I miss the character, and I miss the beauty of it. But I don't miss dead bodies in a dumpster when you yeah, least you, suspect it. You, you don't miss hearing gunshots going. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not for me. It's the truth, man. <laughs> I remember you know, people getting shot in my neighborhood all the time. Yeah, when well, you I'm, said that, I had a vision of my friend Mike, his him and his his two being, brothers. Are you being serious? No, I swear to God. Yeah, yeah, being serious. <laughs> I mean, we're, being kind of, we're kind of fucking around with me, like. <laughs> no, I mean it. Oh no, when I used to, there was, there there was mayhem in my. You know, I'm Italian. So in the 70s and 80s in Brooklyn, it was pretty rough, man, especially in the 70s. When I was young, man, that I just had a flashback of my friend Mike being carried across the schoolyard because somebody shot him in the leg because he was trying to steal the hubcaps off of their car. Um, and they were going to go back and get well, the guy. Well, in Texas, <laughs> yeah. well, we used to steal hubcaps You don't shoot in Texas. the kids. Yeah, you know. No, we don't shoot. But you get your ass kicked in Texas, like when, especially in the neighborhood I grew up in. And I grew up in a pretty, I played ball with, you know. No nonsense type of guys. Yeah, I mean, I played with like, we had a huge Vietnamese uh, uh, community in our neighborhood in Houston. We have a lot of Vietnamese. And uh, so I grew up. A lot up of what? Vietnamese. Oh. From Vietnam. Oh, Vietnamese. Vietnamese, yeah. It's, oh, very good. I am an actor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how, you like, how you like my diction? <laughs> how I, I just degenerated a whole country, but okay. Uh, Listen, man, <laughs> you are in the right room. Between oh. you and I, there'll be plenty of uh, vo- vocabulary mistakes going on. Yeah. And oh. people that listen to the show always tell me the things that I say wrong. So <laughs> you're in good company, my friend. Um, but So there was Vietnamese in Houston? Yeah, tons, dude, tons. I mean, it was because what happened with Houston was after the oil crash, like in the, in, in the early 80s, Houston was like, well, we need to kind of like, you know, change the economy of the country. So, yeah. we, so they brought in, you know, uh, health care. They brought in industry. They brought in finance because they were just too dependent on oil. And that brought in everybody and brought in a lot of Vietnamese because they were working offshore. So they started coming to Houston to work on oil rigs. Oh, and so, interesting. And so then the, the community just grew and it's massive. So and, you guys had you guys had the first massage parlors in America? Oh, yeah. Happy endings all over oh, the place. Oh, very dude. good. I'm oh. very proud of you. Oh, yeah. God bless uh, oh, Houston for let that. Let me tell you, dude. Let me get, get some Vietnamese food and go get a nice happy ending massage. Yeah, man. What's better than that? Productivity straight yeah. up. Or you could do it both at the same time. <laughs> I don't know. I don't Maybe know. they could just feed you, but I don't know. Vietnamese food does not sound. Yeah, uh, I mean, eating compelling. spicy food and then doing that. Anything uh, from they just catch whatever they catch, they deep fry it and feed it to you. Yeah, no, they 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 have no mercy in what they're going to eat. <laughs> I mean, they, so I mean, did, were there kids like Vietnamese 
kids going to school and you grew up yeah, with them so and I they were like up, second generation? Yeah, so I grew up with, uh, you know, by the way, we still haven't introduced me. Not that I give a fuck. Yeah, what's your name? Uh, Douglas. Douglas what? Terrell. I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to say Terrell again. <laughs> I know. I mean, <laughs> but I'm going to say it. Douglas Terrell. What's crazy is I tweeted out like, hey, we're going to be talking about acting my show, maybe. And I was right. The maybe is probably the oh, most. Oh, no. Important. We're going to get to it, man. Um, See, no, but, but I played ball with Vietnamese guys and they were badass. I they were good. Me, oh, dude. We had a guy named uh, Dong Tong. Of course you did. And he fucking, when he hit you. Okay, I throwed the bar, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. That's no. my go-to Asian. <laughs> no, it's just, it's horrible. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, so I throwed the ball to you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's as good as it gets, my friend. You're a world-class actor. Look who you're dealing with. But it's so bad that uh, it's good. Exactly. That's that's the thing. That it's Thank so, you so very much. You so, understand what I'm, com- what I'm doing. It's so bad that it works. Yes. Like, like you can actually use that for all Asian. It's, that's right. It's for all Asian. That's what I do. Korean, okay, Chinese. Okay, guys, a double pray, okay? <laughs> Today we make a double pray. Oh, so good. I mean, Baseball is so good. I mean, what's that actor's name? He made a freaking career out of it. And you know, the guy, the guy in... Uh, <laughs> What's, Who made a career out of that? I mean, what was the guy? Yeah, he did. He made him millions. What's his name? <laughs> what was the movie? Uh, Hangover. The guy who jumps out of the car naked, right? Oh, well, he did. So I guess yes, that the guy who jumps out of the car naked. So I literally thought I know that, that, that dude was like Asian and, you know, I didn't know. I saw him in a Duke documentary. Yeah. And he's like perfect English. He's a doctor. Like, right? Yeah, yeah. He's like, so yeah. I, mean, I remember when Duke was playing, you know, I was like, what? Fuck. Where's the guy who's like, hello, motherfucker. Yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, he sounded like amazing, like he was like American, you know? So next time somebody says it's offensive what I'm doing, I'm like, no. No. It's an imitation of the guy who jumps out of the car naked. I mean, that's what he does. I mean, he made millions off of that. I mean, he's he's doing, no matter what he he does, he'll always be remembered as the guy who jumped out of the car naked. Okay, Douglas, hit the bar, okay? I'm rooting for you so much. You Uh, mean my sister may ring? Yeah. She touches you so nice, $40, okay? Forty dollar, you pay first, okay? Uh, I have to do. It's mandatory. I say that line when I do that voice. But, uh, all right, so you played uh, Vietnamese. First of all, Douglas Torrell. Yeah. All right, Douglas Torrell. That's fine. Played with Vietnamese people when he was younger. Yes. So you toyed with them essentially <laughs> I, as I an did. evil, evil Houston Texonian. Yeah, Texas and Houstonian. You know what's amazing about I? You know I don't meet many. It's it's crazy because when you I grew up in Houston. What I was trying to say, now, I'll go back, <laughs> is that in Texas... Sorry, man. You're in the web of my fucking brain, and it's, <laughs> it is. it's a horrible Where, place to be. What door is this? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, there's porn here. Holy shit. Wait a minute. What's this? Beer. Oh, this is even worse porn now. <laughs> and yeah. now there's beer and more porn. And No, but what I was going to say is Asians that, that you would get your ass kicked if you said the wrong thing to the wrong person. I think so. You, I think that's a generational thing, though, too. I mean, well, maybe, well, no, no not, not really. I don't think Certain so. Certain places, no. are, places are civilized. You know, like, yeah, and, and, yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, we used to have, I mean, like I used to get in fist fights all the time. I, 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 what's crazy is... Yeah, you used I, to have I, a lot of fights when you were a kid, right? I talk to people, and I find this strange. I, I think, I mean, it's. I'm sure it's a good thing. But you know when you meet guys who say, I've never been in a fist fight? Yeah. And you're like, mm-hmm. never? Yeah. He says, no. You mean never in your never life? Never in your life. Like you've never punched someone. He goes, no, no I don't even know what that's like. Nobody and I did a, sh- I did a show. I did true, yeah, I did True West with some dude. And I was playing Lee and... You know, I was getting in character, and Lee's, you know, Lee's a, like, Lee's a, he, basically, Lee's a motherfucker. Lee's a motherfucker from the play he, uh, True, True, West True West by Sam I know Shepard. all, yeah, of course. That's phenomenal. Sammy's play. a good fucking guy, bro. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Rest his peace. Rest yeah, rest, peace. God bless him. I was so sad when that happened. Then. No, I mean, the guy was prolific, too. I mean, he, yeah. I once heard him say that he could write a play a week if Broadway could take it. I could, too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> what that play would be, wow. we do not know. But oh, you want it to be quality? Yeah, yeah, yeah quality. That's different. Yeah, and wow. you. But he. So I talked. I'll to I'll start the guy. writing one right now. Oh my god, <laughs> this would be a it's, play. It's called Hero Douglas. <laughs> Hello, Hero Douglas. Hello, we Douglas. play a baseball, okay? Okay, you I'm do gonna it, do that huh? all day. I'm gonna be driving around doing that now. <laughs> Hero <laughs> Douglas. Hello, Douglas. <laughs> my kids are gonna be in the back seat. Like what? That stop. Um, but so I I talked to the guy and. You know, I had like I slapped something out of his hand and he got really like he's like stopped rehearsal. 
and he's, and this was during the course of the play. No, no, it was during rehearsal. Yeah, but in rehearsal, but it was it was in character. In other in words, it was yeah. in, in context to the play. It's not yeah. like you just in real life got mad at him and smacked something. No, no, I, I, he was uh, he was at the typewriter, and I and I he had a, a beer can, and I fucking smacked it out of his hand. I did it really hard, so he stopped rehearsal, and he was like, "Hey, dude, you just gotta let me know if, you, if you're gonna hit me that hard." And oh, I, and I said, "Wow, well, what do you mean, dude? I mean, I mean, what do you think I would do?" Because well, that was kind of hard, and I said, "Well, what?" And so we started going this conversation, and I and he said. Then the director started, he started talking to the director a couple of rehearsals later, and then he actually said, Doug scares me. <laughs> well, you scare me too, Doug. Yeah, I scare myself. I can see that. So he scared, he was physically intimidated. Yeah, he was physically intimidated. You. And so, uh, so I said, dude, hey, haven't you ever been in a fist fight? I mean, this is kind of what this is. I, I saw Lee and Austin kind of like two guys and about to get in a fist fight. And to me, which is the thing about great about Austin, Austin is trying not to be Lee, but at the end of the play, he turns out to be just as vicious, just, and that's Sam Shepard's. If you notice all his plays, that's his. Yeah. That's his. That's his kind of like his through line in all his plays. That no matter who you are as a kid, you will always be that at the end of the day. Ah. Uh, like you can you can mask it, you can tape it, you can. But this is who you. This are. This is who you are, and so Austin's the whole character. Austin's really the most fascinating character because Lee's kind of. That's pretty interesting. One note, but I like that. Austin is this guy who's trying to become a writer, right? If you remember the play, and he's like, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not you, you know, and and and, and Lee's like, no, you, you're just, you're, you're a motherfucker, just like me. Uh, to the end of the play, he's choking Lee, and he's like, he's gone berserk. He's like, he's, he's basically Lee has got Lee has brought him back down to the, to the. He's exposed the animal that he, he really is, is. Really is, and that's sad, all. And of, so you were doing a good job, I think. I was, I was, and I the guy literally told me, and I meet people all the time. They, yeah, I've never been in a fist fight. Isn't it crazy? And I was like, yeah, I go, you mean never? Never. He goes, never. Like, you've never... But you would expect it from... Like, guys our age, I've, I was in a, a ridiculous a, a fist fights all the time. Oh, if you, if, if you, all the time. I told people, in my school, I went to a public, huge public high school, you either fought or got your ass kicked. You fought or got your ass kicked, and there was always... And, and by the way, when we talk about stuff like this... It wasn't as ultra violent as you would suspect. No. Like I think what scares people is the violence, like the idea that you, like, if a kid, like sometimes I see these fights online, and uh, what bothers me about this new shit that's going on is that nobody stops it once a kid's down. What do you once, mean? like when we used to fight, there were plenty of fights I've been in. Once somebody was losing. The oh, other yeah. kids would separate yeah, them. Yeah. Like, that's enough. Yeah. You got them. It's over. Yeah. You go your separate ways. There's a lot of... Well, I, maybe it existed when we were kids, but there's a lot of stuff I see out there, like the vicious fucking beating and the continual beating. We were talking about how I trained in martial arts. As I got older, I started training in martial arts and karate and jiu-jitsu oh, really? and stuff like that. And one of the funny things is I'll never forget, like... Maybe two or three months into it going, oh, I, I never really had a fight. I never really threw a punch the right way. I never knew how to really, really fight. I fought. Yeah. I was ready to fight, but I was never as dangerous. I know exactly what you're talking about because I boxed in college, amateur boxer. Oh, wow. So there and, you go. And I did fight night. And the guy who, I, who trained me how to fight, he was a skinny guy and he wanted to learn how to lift weights. And we became friends because we lifted at the same gym okay. in college. And he said, if you help me lift weights, I'll teach you how to box. And I was like, sure. The guy was probably, uh, you know, as you get older, you start exaggerating things. But I mean, he, I mean, he was probably like 5'10", and he weighed fucking maybe 160 pounds, 170 pounds. It's not, it's not an exaggeration. He was skinny, and he was lightning fast, and he could fucking tear you up. When he would hit the bag, yep. I, I literally felt the vibration of the bag. Mm -hmm. And later I found out he was a golden glove boxer yeah. in the Navy. Sure. And I said, I, I always tell that story because... Because that would be the dude that you would pick on in a bar, and you would be you would be making a lethal mistake. Yeah, like he would like hit you three times so hard before you even knew what happened, and and your face would be ruined. <laughs> yeah, like I know, you, man. You know, like I know exactly. And so like you think you fight because really when we fought in high school, it was like it was this. Yeah, you're yeah. coming out from out here. So as soon as you start learning the the jab, just yeah. the, just the jab, jab cross. The idea that you that you have to. Get your pivot your back foot and get your hips into it, and the idea that you're driving with your weight and get that, or that momentum, or that you're gonna duck, or that you're gonna duck, yeah, chin like down, chin down, yeah, all that you know, stuff. Keep that chin tucked in, you know, it's so and, funny, and man. It's so yeah, true. And it's true. I, I know exactly what you're saying. Isn't though. isn't it a different universe when and, you know a little bit about what you're doing? And that's why I always tell a story like, be very careful when you see a skinny dude and you want to pick on him because you should yes. like first ask him, hey, you know, by the way. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you, you, have you ever fought before? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, the fuck. Give me that beer. <laughs> hey guys, I'm I'm looking to get into a fight with somebody in the bar. Can we just play a show of hands? <laughs> Martial artists. Okay. <laughs> hands down. <laughs> Boxers. Okay. Gotcha. You know People who've never been in a fight. All right. I'm gonna fuck with you. Right. Yeah. That's that's uh. So you know, for me that that was an a, an enlightening awake an awakening. But to never have been punched. Never. That's out there. No, it was. And then I meet guys all the time at this age, especially in the acting community. And, you know, we, we start talking and, and I, sometimes I tell them my stories and because I didn't get into acting until I got into, I didn't get into until college. Well, that's what I want to talk about. So you're born and raised in, in Texas. Yeah. Where are your parents from? So my mom is Colombian. Colombian. My father passed away recently, but he's I'm from. Sorry Ar- to hear that. Thank man. you. Uh, but he was from Argentina. So Argentina. Oh, you got some hot blood running through your veins, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And, and. Did they grow up in? Te- were they? Did they come from? Were they yeah, first so, generation? No, yeah, no, they no, they met in New York in '67. Oh, as really? Immigrants, and my dad was a merchant marine. He worked on oil tankers. Wow! And so he got. So that's how he wound up in Houston. In Houston, the oil thing. Yeah. Work met on, your mom in New York. He, he was a chef. He was a chef, and he worked on oil tankers. What kind of guy was he? He was he tough. Was, he was Jewish. He was poor, and he was cheap. Jewish. Yeah. He was a Jew from. Argentina. Argentinian Jew. Argentinian Jew, which was, there's a lot of Jews in Argentina because Argentina was the only country pretty much in the history of the world that took in Jews who were being there, who were being murdered everywhere. Well, that explains why they let you work in show business. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, because, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm Jewish too, fellas, if there's anybody out there listening. Skull and no. bones. <laughs> skull and bones. <laughs> Those are my people. The Jews run, I would love to find out that the Jews ran skull and bones. That would be great. I would, like, skull and bones I runs would, the world. <laughs> I would not be surprised. Though. I know, I know. So he was... Jewish? He was. You called him cheap. Yeah, he was cheap, cheap and poor. <laughs> Had nothing. Those two things are not related. No, they're not Being related. Jewish and cheap. No, we're not no, saying he, that. He was just cheap. Well, so we're my, not my dad that. was one of eight. He grew up in the streets. Had an eighth grade education. He basically he was a he was a fighter. You know, he. I mean, not this, not in a physical way. But I mean, he was kind of. You know, I think all he was a scrappy guy. In that scrappy. generation, they were scrappy. Well, I tell people all the, all the time because I'm always talking about it. But I mean, you, you know, like my dad. It was. It's so I just ge- wanted to show you that. Go ahead. Go ahead. He, he, he like he, he would get pissed off so easy, and I never understood it. Like he, I mean, he, he would fly. I off. love guys. Like- he would just like like you were ter- you were terrified of my dad. Like my, my dad, my dad. You were like- terrified of him. You're like, oh shit! If I say this thing, he's gonna lose his mind. I mean, I th- 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 he was just he always had a temper, and it was always. I always thought he was depressing, but then as I got older, I realized, you know, it was just so hard to put food on the table. I was frustrated, and so. He we was were, frustrated. He was frustrated, and to him, as long as I he gave me four walls, and he used to say it all the time, four walls, a roof, and there was always, and we always thank God, we always food. I, we always have food in the refrigerator, and we I never had to worry about milk, eggs. Nothing. Imagine this day and age. Imagine telling your kids like you have food. That's enough. Yeah. No. 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 It's never enough. And to him, it was enough. And he was right. And he was right. That and was their fucking job because he came from keep the streets. You, keep you safe. Yeah. Keep you warm. Keep you fed. Keep you fed. And and try luck. to get you to go to school. And good luck. And go fuck yourself. And go fuck yourself. I don't. Even, I used to tell people, and this is no joke. It's not. No, it, it is a joke. But I, you know, I used to say like my father didn't even know what my name was until I was around twelve. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was always, "Hey, you, stop that. Get me that. Go ask your mother." You go, know. Go ask. But your- but as a result, we grew up a little different. We were tougher. We figured stuff out on our own. Yeah. We we fought, and we learned how to lose a fight and win a fight and move on with your life. It didn't devastate you, no. you know? And I think there's a certain amount of toughness that comes with that. Yeah, no, I mean, you learn how to, um, I mean, it's survive. I mean, you, you just, you learn how to get um, calluses on your skin, and basically. So, yeah, and, and so you were growing up in Houston with mom and dad. They were working class, tough Please. neighborhood. Yeah, so, it, you know, it wasn't like I grew up in, you know, South Philly or no, something, you know? Tough. When you say, t- when I say tough, you know, I, like you said, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean there has to be mayhem going on no, in the streets. Yeah, it was But I mean, it was a different time. It like, was, you know, yeah, it wasn't like, you know, you know, Compton, you know, like. Yeah, right, you know, right, but right, right. It was the neighborhood that, you know, uh, I mean, we had, I had fist. F- it was like I Compton had, with worse music, probably. Yeah, no. Compton had some good musicians come out of uh, that area. It had some, you know, NWA, yeah. baby. I mean, <laughs> I mean, some guys are billionaires now, only in America. Right. Um, God bless them. God, God bless them. God bless anybody. Good for them, rich. man. Yeah, exactly, man. And so, so did you play sports a lot? I did. Well, an sports, yeah. So sports was the only way. Sports was a way for you to kind of develop um, street cred, right? So, yeah. Because either 
especially in Texas. Street cred more or less, right? Yeah, especially, especially in, in Texas. Texas. Such a big, especially but, you know, in Texas. Yeah, because in my high school, if you didn't play football or baseball or basketball, you were kind of shit. That's crazy, right? Like you were not going to... Well, I, I went to high school in Arizona. It was similar in that sense. Oh, yeah. So like, I went to high school in Arizona. Like, I, we left Brooklyn when I was 11 and I went to Arizona. Similar in that sense. I never forget my first football game as a freshman and the fucking stands were packed. Yeah. Because I was playing... Uh, up until my first game, I was only practicing. Yeah. And then when you get there and the lights are on, marching band, freshman. Yeah. So it's a big deal. It's we, like Texas we, yeah, in that and, sense. I mean, we played in a stadium. We shared a stadium with four, three other high schools. Stadium. Yeah, it was a stadium. I know. And I tell people, we seated 10,000 people. Fuck. That's unbelievable. In high school. That's unbelievable. In high school. And let me tell you, we were always good and we were always full. What was the name of the high school you went to? Do you mind? J. Frank Doby High School. J. Frank Doby High, high school. school. In fact, when you... Did you ever see the movie Friday Night Lights? Yes. So at the very end of the movie, they have like... When they, where they're going through their whole... Um, uh, the the they're going through the divisions and they're showing all the different schools. You'll see Doby in there. So that's part of it. And, the- and everybody knew how good they were. I mean, like uh, P- Permian High School, like they were like you know the cream of the crop. Like everybody knew Permian Permian High School, and that's okay. that's where that movie is based off of. Okay, it was based. It's a small Texan dirt town that all they have was high school football, and they were tough as fuck. They were such good football players. I mean, and you played was- in high school. You played high school football. Yeah. And wow. so, what position? Uh, linebacker. Yeah, exactly. Fucking animal. And I and and me too. I was outside linebacker. Yeah, and I and I played with some really good athletes. Like we graduated my high school graduation class. We had around five hundred to six hundred people. So you know, we gra- uh, my high school was two two thousand twenty five hundred kids. So it's a lot of kids. It's a lot of kids. It's a pretty big. It's a high lot school. of kids. And we were considered. Uh, we were five A. So and back in uh, they don't do that here in the Northeast, but. They they classify high schools like one A two A three A four A five A yeah and super five A was just starting to come out super five A so that means your high school super five A had more than three thousand how do kids. we make this more ridiculous okay let's make it super five A yeah yeah and from what I hear because I mean I haven't been watching Texas high school football so much but um, there's even a six A now it's gotten so big the community the, the it's city based of on, Houston it's based is, on the population of the school of the school exactly. <laughs> Because then, the, so basically, like when a five A school play, or when I play, like when we played a four A school, yeah, out of it, we would cream them, right? You would, you would, right? Oh, it would beat them. It'd be like, you know, do we want to let the water girl play? Yeah, and you, sure. and, oh my god! So you guys, do, <laughs> yeah, but, but fifty you know, to nothing, you know. But you know what's funny is like, um, it reminds me when I. It's similar. It's so much more in, intense than Arizona, but it's similar in the sense that they took it seriously and. I remember coaches trying to recruit high school students to come into there. Did that happen a lot? Where you try to get the kid who's from another town to so we, come and move? Like, yeah, was I it mean, that prevalent? Like, was, yes. was it that insane? It was insane. Not if, not for our high school because our high school it was really the, the, the well, you were set. The district was kind of locked. Yeah, you were set, and you couldn't really get in. But I mean, fuck. I mean, I mean, we had so many athletes in our high school that we had enough to stock a badass football team and have some of our best athletes quit football. That's right. Like I mean, that's how many. Like, <laughs> that's, that's how that's many how, fucking. That's so how, you could have fielded two football teams. Yeah, you, almost. we could have almost field the four. Like <laughs> some of our best guys decided not to play, and they they played baseball, and baseball was really big. Yeah, and and, and so one guy got drafted by the Royals, um, and he. So I mean, we and we had a good well, baseball. Well, team. let me ask you this: Were, were the uh, baseball coaches and football coaches at odds in the sense that they didn't want they didn't no they, like they were like you if you play baseball you can't play football or. That, it would, but that wouldn't work then. No. Like, why would they just choose baseball over football? Like, they didn't want to play football anymore. But Yeah, some guys just didn't want to get hit anymore. And you could still sustain that kind of blow. Even though they were great athletes, you could sustain the blow of them not playing football and still have a great football team. Yeah, I mean, that's how many athletes Fuck. we had. I mean, we had... So, in fact... You know, that's we were my high school career was the was what was when the the law no pass no play was being being uh, legislated was oh, being yeah. passed right. But if you don't pass, if you don't have good grades, C, you can't play football. C average, you don't get to play football, right. and that's law now. And I think, thank God that didn't happen with my age. Yeah, I mean, I think age. that's I'm a little bit older now. than you, and I don't think I think it worked out well for me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean and there was a couple of guys. He was like, dude. dude. <laughs> I know you ain't passing. I don't know why you're on this football field. I mean, I know why you're on the football I don't field. Know what but you I, mean? I got an A plus. Yeah, yeah. He's holding the paper upside down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Doesn't even know how to read. Yeah. You know, uh, he's holding up a can of soup. He thinks it's a report card. Yeah. That's all right. Just get in there and block somebody, Billy. And so we still even had athletes who couldn't. We had like we had like three guys. That were, I remember four guys that were amazing. 
Yeah. I played junior high with them, and they just, for some reason, when they got to high school, man, they couldn't pass. They just were. They just could not get their grades right. They're and, dumb. And yeah, they're dumb and lazy. And they and, were, and, and and their you football. You just described half of my age group. Half of the guys I hung out with. And their football career was over. Yeah, it was done. Was, oh, that's fucked. And it was miserable because they had to do PE. No, so if you didn't play football, oh, you had to do PE. So I one day, once I got in trouble, and they sent me to the PE class, and I was doing PE, and I remember. I remember this one thing, we, for this P uh, instructor we had, he made us run like a quarter mile. You know, that was like our, you know, our, our oh, it was for detention. I got detention. And so they, one of my detention was to, to go to PE. And so I had to run this quarter mile and I was running with these guys who I knew were good athletes. I played because we had two, our high school was basically a combination of two junior high schools that came together. Yeah. And so I knew these guys from the other junior high school and, and they're like, they're, they like run a four or five in the 40 or something, you know, and they're, and there's literally like, I don't want to, can you say dorks? But I mean, there's like, and there's, there's, you could say dorks. You you, say have do- you listened to my show? I listened a little bit of it. Yeah. I did. Well, that's just why I know I can kind of go off, off the Please cuff. do. Please because do. I was like, okay. Dorks, you, I, I want to make wits, sure. Yeah. Idiots, idiots, retards. Retards. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So See? like, you know, you're running with some, you know, dimwits and idiots and, 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 and retards. And re- it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I, there's retards in my family, so I'm more allowed to use that. <laughs> You're word. allowed to yeah. say it, okay? Yeah. And like, I mean, these guys, I mean, and I, they would run the quarter mile, and they, I would be like, these fuckers are so fast. Like, like, why are they not playing? playing football? What the fuck are you like, doing? Like, man? they would like, it was almost comical how fast. See, they that were. was the opposite of my high school. As soon as they realized you were, you couldn't pass. They they in, they encouraged you to play football. They encouraged. They were you. like, we want the we want the cream of the crop of the fucking morons on that field. <laughs> yeah, that's you know <laughs> you uh, know Rutgers, dude. Uh, you know how many you know how many concussions and fucked up shit. So many guys would get knocked out. They would literally put them on the bench and prop them up, and they're like talking, speaking in tongues, and barely audible and barely there, and then. Four or five plays later, you're like, where is he? And they're like, he's blocking somebody yeah. now. Because when I watched the protocol, the, the concussion protocol, which is great you for the, the NFL, NFL. Yeah. I watched that. If a guy gets a little dizzy, he's he's out for at least a play or two. Yeah. They have to, doctors have to check them. In our day and age, man, dizzy? So, so <laughs> dizzy. You played the whole game dizzy, you know? So my, I wonder my, how much damage is done to us and so we don't even realize it. You know? Yeah, no, I mean, so it's a conversation between all. So I played ball all through high school. And we had about six guys together, and it's amazing because to, to this day we're still best friends. That's we, good. We still talk That's crap, good. and we have a couple texting. of them that I still yeah, talk to. And, yeah, and and I think we'll be like that. You know, God bless us until the you know until we all take our last breath. But right, um, um, good stuff. We would, yeah, it's great stuff. Um, and, and we developed that bondship in practice, basically. You know, because we would talk shit, and then we always party together, and blah blah blah. Yeah, but partying I, in high school. I, yeah, and I, so me and my friends, we talk oh, the best. Isn't uh, it, uh, oh. man? That's the other thing, man. I look at my son; oh, he's third store. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> it's a party. In high school. Oh, you just, you just went through the. T- <laughs> I, I love how you describe my brain as having different doors that you're walking through. Wait till my friend Bruno was and Mike hear this. I feel like I, I feel like I'm on a conveyor belt. You know, I'm opening doors. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We're in high school now. It's like high school football. I mean, oh, hey, anyway, high school I'm parties. Sorry, you know what happened? You reminded me that my son is 13, and when I first went out there, I was like a good friend of mine, Jeff. You know, he was. I was in shit eighth grade. I'd walk to his house in the morning, and then we'd go to school. And then one morning, he decided, "Hey, man, we should try some whiskey." Oh, before God. we go to school, it was the first time I ever drank, and I was 12. 12. Yeah, that's not. So a good we drank idea. some whiskey, went to school. Drunk. That doesn't sound like a good idea. My favorite part of this story is our history teacher, Mr. Schrader. His response to it, he basically knew we were drunk. And he uh, called me up to the desk. He talked to me for a couple of minutes. Saw that I was drunk, right? Imagine this happening in this day and age. Uh, Both of us. He called Jeff and I up to the desk. You could tell. We didn't know. We were drunk. This is the first time I ever had alcohol and it was whiskey. It was straight up Jack Daniels. So by the time we got to school, pounded, not even understanding what was happening I mean, to that, us. That, that doesn't even sound like a good idea. It's a bad idea. Like it feels horrible. That was the first of 40 years of bad ideas, by the way. I'll <laughs> yeah. get to that in a little bit. Um, uh, it was a really, you are who you are as a child, right? Well, the guy who drank the whiskey that's, is that's, the same guy you're talking to at 12. So, so whenever you see a Sam Shepard play, know that that's every, me. every play, that's, <laughs> that's what about. he's telling you. Like He's basically telling you no matter how 
fucked up you are, <laughs> right? No matter what you do, you're right. always going to stay be- fucked up. The best way to do that is embrace it, brother. Embrace it. That's why you're. That's why we're sitting in the studio. It's a little play play pen for me. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just a place where I could be an idiot. Um, dude, they sent us to the nurse. He sent us to the nurse. Imagine in this day and age, this happening. He sends us to the nurse, right? He calls up the nurse, says something, and we go over to the nurse. We get there. The nurse is smoking a cigarette. And we're in Arizona, and she's got a cowboy hat on. And she said something along the lines of, you two boys really, you two boys really make me sick, but in a good way. She, she appreciated the idea that we were drunk on whiskey. Because we both lied. Oh, I'm sick. I have a fever. You know, we lied and said we were sick. So instead of like sending us home or calling our parents. She sent you to practice. She gave us aspirin and kept us there and made us made us keep drinking water. And then finally I threw up and Jeff threw up. We threw up eventually. Yeah. that. And it was horrible. You know, when you're drunk, when you're drunk throwing up. Well, I'm just telling this story for the for the, the punchline is this. It was 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. By around 12, 12.30, she had us somewhat normal and sent us back to class. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah if, you so, did, if you did that in my high school playing football. Oh, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You would be. The coach. That's the second thing I wanted to tell you. Yeah, you, you would the be coach, paying a heavy price. The coach beat the shit out of us for about two weeks over that. Yeah, yeah. Beat us. And that's. and That's exactly what should but, happen, what but, would happen. But our parents me. never knew. Oh, that's cool. Our, uh, we well, see now that see, the, our the, friends the, never knew only that we told do, them because now if a coach doesn't do doesn't tell your parents he can lose his job. Oh, he can lose his job. Where back then the coach could, listen, the coach, man, can, my, the coach can literally yeah, tell a parent. Doug, I'm going to tell off. you. I'm going to tell you, man. The coaches in high school. I I want to. I really. There's one that's still around. His name is Coach Webb from Arizona. I I want to go back and give him a hug because those guys kept us straight, man. When when I was my grades started failing. Uh, my coach came, called me in, and I was seeing this girl. She was beautiful, beautiful girl. Mm. And my coach called me in and said, "You know, let's let's say her name was Jill, okay?" And he said, "I see you spend a lot of time around that Jill girl, but you don't spend a lot of time in them books, do you, boy?" <laughs> I said, "Well, so you don't say a goddamn fucking word to me, boy." <laughs> <laughs> he, like this is the type of shit that would, and he fucking yelled at me and grabbed my shirt and got in my face and I was forbidden to see her until my grades went up. Oh, that's so good. what does that mean? That means I have to sneak behind his back and go under the bleachers, like because you're not going to just disrespect the coach like that. No, you, I, mean, I mean we had a coach, right? When I played ball, we had a coach called. He's, I never forget him. His name is. Fuck. It's crazy, right? It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, 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 we started, but everybody's listening to this. I started talking about football because I was talking about concussions. Now I'm talking about Coach Teeley. I, there you I, go, I, Coach Teeley. I don't even know. It, it, to Coach fact, Teeley, take your rifle spot in the in door number five thousand three hundred and forty-two. I'm not even in my op- brain. I'm not even opening the doors. The doors by the way, are my opening. Do- as my I go doors by. are going through your doors now, so it's yeah, all intertwined, my yeah, friend. Like I don't even know, Coach Teeley. Coach Teeley. Let he, me think. He, he, black hair. No, he was a gray hair. Great old old school. Old okay, school. He was, he was tall. School. Did he have a fucked up eye? No, he had. My coach had a fucked up eye. He he smoked. <laughs> there you go. He was a. I mean, he was a fucking chain smoker. There you go. He was a chain there smoker, and he he I smoked on the practice field. <laughs> fucking, fucking amazing. And he, appara- I love that. He had this ring. He had he, he he won a state championship when he was in high school. So yep. he always wore this ring, oh. and he was tall. He was like, I mean, he was I mean, he's probably six three. Tough as hell. Yeah, tough as hell. Oh, he was terrible. He was he was he was uh, head of the defense. His he, face looked like an defense. old burnt steak, probably. And everybody loved him. I mean, yep. you 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 wanted everybody would run through doors for him. You would die for a guy like that. But when he do anything. yelled at you, he would grab your face mask like this, right? Mm-hmm. He'd grab it right here, and he'd be have a cigarette in his mouth. God damn it, Terrell! When I talk to you, you listen to me. When you get up in that line, you do as I say. You you hear me? And smoke is spewing, and you're like, <laughs> you're smoke. really ashes, fucking f- little <laughs> specks of fucking fire. And then after all that abuse from the smoke and the verbal abuse <laughs> and the violence, he would grab his hand. If you remember playing football. And smack the side of your helmet, Bang. right in the ear hole, right, dude. You ear it, hole, and it concusses you, and it makes that, that never, loud sound. If you've never played football, yep. you don't know how loud when you put a helmet on, and so you can hit it with a towel, and it sounds 
40 times louder. That's right. And so if you hit it with a ring with violence, it yep. sounds like someone hits you with a sledgehammer. And they also, pu the palm of their hand covers the ear hole so that the sound doesn't escape the hole and it just ricochets off the inside of the helmet. Oh, it was like you... An ear hole slap is one of the hardest th things to deal with and, in high school. And, and what would happen is... Once you learned what the system of abuse was going to be when he called you over. <laughs> you try to prepare for it. <laughs> you, no, you could because you knew you were going to three stages. It's like saying, it's like basically saying, you're, it's basically like walking up to the electric chair and like, you know what's going to happen. Like, and so he, like, he would grab you and he would yell like, and, like, and, and after he does that two, after two or three times, you know what's coming. Oh, here comes the smack in the head. With the, the it's like you're walking up to the electric chair and it's like, all right, they're, they're warming up the generator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fuck! Yeah, oh, and, it looks like the amperage is almost ready now. They're gonna press the button. And sure enough, he'd smack you, and you'd be like, "There it is, oh, man!" Oh, that hurts. oh God, that that he, Coach Webb was that guy for me. We're talking about high school sports. Did you did you act in high school? Did you get no. into drama? No. When did it happen? I got for you? in college. I was madly in love with a girl. Uh, where, where in college? Where'd you go to college? Uh, I went to Ole Miss. Ole Miss. Yeah. Look at you. And uh, you had an all American upbringing, didn't you? I did. I did. I was very fortunate. I mean, I Texas. I had an American story. I mean, that that's the beauty about this country and what I try to. I mean, that's the reason why I do my play because I try to tell people. You know, my father was the most patriotic, patriotic man you could have ever met. Yeah, there's a fine line nowadays between people. It, it's okay to be pa patriotic, isn't it? I think. Yeah, it is. <laughs> have, it is. Yeah. It doesn't mean you know the, this whole thing with the. How do you feel about the kneeling with the flag and all that stuff? I mean, listen, my play's called The American Soldier. Yep. So I, for me, not, I, I'm not a big fan of it. I don't like it. I think it's, I think it's, um, I get that they're not, I know what, I know what the message is that we're not disrespecting the flag. We're trying to make a point. But to me, I do, I am one of those people that I look at the American flag as something sacred. But, you know, I get it, man. I'm white, you know, and, that doesn't, no, you're not. You're Colum Your mother's. Well, but I mean, people see me as white. What well, well, doesn't matter? Yeah. I mean, I'm Italian. Yeah. You know, my family's from Italy. But you're um, white too. We're American. So. Yeah. Look, that's the thing, man. I think it oversimplifies it. White. Look, you can. <clears throat> two things can exist at the same time. What I don't like is that is that that's not that's your narrative. Like when somebody kneels for the flag, and then somebody defends them kneeling, they say, well. They're kneeling because of the there there are cops killing kids out on the street, yeah. and I say there's an element to cops that do that. There's an element of of the of the fucking population of police that do that. An element, and it's a very small percentage, and they're fucking animals. That's the answer. If a guy's gonna pull a gun, and if that's really happening, and a guy pulls a gun and he takes a man's life, or a person's life, or a child's life, or a old guy's life, or Whatever. any fucking life. That guy's a murderer and he should be dealt with, right? That exi That's where that issue is. That's how you compartmentalize that. To kneel for the flag means you're co-opting the fucking meaning of the flag. You're injecting that narrative into it. Because if you're going to do that, you can do that with anything. You can do that with shoplifting. You can do that with fucking pedophilia. You could do it with anything. Well, I, see, I'm with you. Like, I'm against it. I mean, I, my play is based basically on letters from veterans and I try to describe people what the incredible commitment and sacrifice veterans and their family members have made. Thank you. You know what? I was going to I was going to get here slowly but fuck it it's too powerful. The name of your play is The American Soldier. But I in many ways just just to throw out the devil advocate, you know, question or 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 flip side of the coin is the flag does represent the the country does represent the ability for you to kneel down. Without question. Without question, and but I would never do it. But by the, you, I would never do it either. And by the way, that's just my opinion. Just like it's the opinion exactly. of the guy kneeling, but I, I think it's wrong. But but I, but it's I, okay. Once he stands up, we're still all Americans, and I love him. I give him a hug. I don't give a fuck. Exactly. You know what I mean? I'm just saying it's a it's a, an opposing. Like I wouldn't vilify the guy. Look, whether we always say Colin Kaepernick, but there's a, hundreds of guys doing it now in sports and in, yeah, in but, football. But really. Colin Kaepernick. He was the guy. He was the he, first one. Well, he's the one who's martyred. Right. I mean, he's, he's the, the one, one who's, who's never going to play. I mean, he's never going to play football again. He's never going to play football again, which is insane. At least in the NFL. I, I think he should. But by the way, it's not insane because it's a bad business move. Again, that's a private business. If you're a key team, you're not. You're not. But, uh, how, but how do you do it? Like, so people make this argument like, okay, let's let's say, let's talk about a couple teams. Let's, Denver. Denver okay. needs a fucking quarterback, okay. right? 
How can you can't bring him in? Bad business. I mean, dude, Denver. Here's the answer. Bad. I'm the owner of Denver. I say it's bad business. Fuck him. Well, exactly. You can't, I mean, <laughs> it's I, very simple. I mean, I mean, it's you you can't simple. bring him in. Like, I mean, ha, ha, ha. I wouldn't give a fuck if he was Joe Montana. No. Well, I mean, you <laughs> bad you, business. But yeah, no. I mean, you know, you know how many how 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 many veterans are in fucking the Colorado area. Like I mean, yeah. you, you would be. It's bad business. Yeah, exactly. So you can't do it. So the I'm, welcome to America, motherfucker. I mean, the only city that you could potentially bring them in would be New York, L.A. Maybe, maybe San LA. Francisco. Did threw them away, right? San Francisco said no. Fuck, man, you're right. I was trying to think about the open-minded, where like liberal I mean, towns, I mean, New York. That's it. I mean, but not really, because the New York Giants fans are not the liberals. No, they're not. They're, they're not. They, they are the, cops, they are the they're cops. They're firemen. firemen. That's I mean, right. Exactly. So, you, so it's so, bad business. So it's bad business. So it's you're you're really as an owner. I mean, how, how can you do it? I mean, you, you just you can't do it. I mean, you got and, and the shame. You, you can't do it. You can't do it. Here's here's the fucking problem. Here's the problem. I don't like Donald Trump. I don't like the way he handled it. I don't like the way he presents himself as a representative of the country. So he exacerbated the fucking problem by saying stupid shit about how guys should get fired and fuck these guys. He's talking to his base all the time. So if he was a you know, good but, leader... But, but you know what he's doing? Dude, he, he's saying things... That these people think. That everyone is thinking. But here's what he could have done. Here's what he could have done. He could have opened the mind to the people that think that way. By inviting Colin Kaepernick in and some of the people in and talking with them, saying, what's on your mind, fellas? And expressing, like, you, you know what I mean? Having a fucking conversation. It would have been nice. It would have been nice if he would bring these guys in, you know? Like yeah. we were talking about the tact and the lack of uh, regalness. regalness that he had with the LeVar Ball situation. Yeah. Same way with this. Yeah, no, I Because get it. here's what a black guy or a black person in America hears. That's just not his thing, man. What, it's fucking ridiculous. But but a black person, when, a, when he talks like that, a black person hears, fuck you, fuck the kids that got shot, fuck your lives. But blacks voted for him, man. Well, listen, some of them did. Some I mean, of them did. A lot of, did. A lot of them did, I guess. Dude, I don't know. Ray, I mean, uh, Ray Lewis and Jim Brown were going up and down, yeah, up and down that I penthouse. Know. I mean, they were friends with him, man. He's I know, got, and so did Kanye. Kanye, and, you know, so it's not like you but know. The, but that to me is a little bit of a circus. To, uh, Jim Brown, is. I Jim Brown, yes. Kanye, even Snoop was shaking his hand before, you know. But the I, but I mean, as a leader, Mike I mean, Tyson you're, you're, voted a, for you're, him. But look, you're you're a, you're a, you're a former athlete, and you're a guy who does this play. Um, if if your leaders, like if your coach, was divisive like that within your team, and he. You know, what wasn't a coach's job to bring you all. Do you remember the brotherhood you talked about? Yeah. That's how you have to kind of approach this entire country. You can't be more separate. You can't separate people more, which is See, what he I, does. I, he, he's divisive in a way. Well, you know, you know? I, I think the problem what's happened today and, you know, I, I've been doing this play now for about three years and I've gone everywhere. I mean, I yeah, man, I hope I'm not, you know, I'm just, I, you know, I, I, it's funny because I'm, I'm taking both sides of the fucking coin. My point, here's what happens, Doug. I'm sorry to cut you off, man. What happens with me is that I don't think anything is always black and white. I never, don't, it never is. You know, I, and I have a hard time. There's always a gray. Right. Coming at it from one side. Like if you call yourself a, a, a liberal Democrat, I already know that I'm, there's no leeway in your thinking. There's no, you just you're gonna come at everything from Republicans are bad, white people are bad, blah 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 blah. Everybody's a victim. That's what I hear when I hear liberal Democrat. So I, I, I had a, you know, so I had and a, Republican same thing. Right wing. If I you call yourself a right wing conservative, I go, uh oh, religious nut. Everybody's bad on the other side. There's so no. I, I, you know. I consider myself pretty much right down the middle, and I try not to let people know. I how, think all of us, a lot of us do. I think the whole country is. I think there, and think that's the problem. That's and, the problem, and, and, and that's why I tell people on the right and on the left, I say. Until you travel the country, you don't know right. why Donald Trump got nominated. You don't know. You don't why. know. And right. So I, and I, and I, I was having this conversation <laughs> with someone who comes out and told me he was, you know, a staunch liberal. And he, okay. And he was kind of just calling everybody who voted for him stupid. Well, there you go. And I said, but see, that's, that's the, problem. the problem. That's the problem. There it is. There it is. Okay. So let's let's just and I and I I always make this conversation. Let's just break it down by numbers, right? So about 120 voted. It was pretty much down the middle, you know. If you take by popular vote, 63 million, 60 million, 62, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And, okay, so you think 60 million people were idiots. 
<laughs> so, so I mean, so so you think yeah. all sixty? So you mean to tell me they had nothing that they were trying to vote for? Yeah. You know, they're, they're, what, 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 could it be taxes? Could it be you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, whatever it be? Uh, you know, domestic legislation. Yes. To, I mean, there's so many things yes. that go into a vote yes, that man. everybody votes that that for you to say absolutely they're all redneck stupid idiots. I go think about it. It's insulting. It, well, it just makes you calling sixty million people idiots like. Th- that's the problem. That's the disconnect. Thank right? you. Which goes to that vice thing, right? That, what, no, so they're not listening to not listening they're to not each li- other. They're not listening to each other, and the rest of the country feels isolated. Like they feel like these fringes are trying to control the country. So you know what they said? Fuck you. I don't care who it is. I don't. I don't care if it's a freaking clown. We're gonna vote that's him exactly in. That's exactly what they we're, did. We're, and we're gonna vote him in. That's exactly right. exactly what they did. That's and exactly what they did. And you know, we're tired of you know globalization. We're tired of all these things. These are very and people want to poo poo these conversations. They're not. And they they're, shouldn't. And they shouldn't. And, and when you go to towns like where I've been, where it was predominantly a sawmill town, which is gone. People forget how many sawmills we had around this country. We used to make wood and paper. Yep. Like left and right. Now it's coming all out of China. Well, you're talking about a whole communities devastated now that now have nothing and i and i go to these communities right and they're not you know people you know globalization we got to get them on the grid whatever that means the grid like i mean i i talk to these people like who are waiters now who at one time were working in a factory or in a sawmill or something like you know you're not going to get this person to learn how to do code like this person he's the grid has left them like you know what I'm saying? He, the like, grid that doesn't exist. Doesn't exist for him. For him. Yeah. Like so, so you, you you you're not going to teach. What are a, they talking about when they talk about the grid? Well, like you know, you, they have to learn you know technology. They have to get into whatever technological not company happening. there is. It's not, not happening. happening. It's gone. It's left them. This guy worked with his hands. So it's going to be maybe his kids. They're going to start making stuff like you know you know Pittsburgh's you know Pennsylvania is a great state to talk about because. They've been a state, and, and, and they're going through a lot of problems. They have this riff, right? And Franco Harris has been talking a lot about it. But, you know, Pittsburgh is, they've kind of reinvented themselves. They're having all these technological companies that are coming in there because they're stealing. The steel comp- factories are gone. It's Mine, going. It's, it's gone. gone. It's yep. right, and they know it. So they, yeah, I but, go to Pittsburgh once a year. I love that town, and it is changing. It's changing. But the people who are working in those technological companies are not the... F- they're not. They're, they're not, not the, the generational Pittsburghians. Yeah, they're not the 50, they're not the 60 year olds. No, that's right. It, it's the kids now. Yep. You know, the kids. They're one, and those jobs are limited, right? So unless you learn how to do that stuff, and a lot of them are re- what they call uh, uh, relocation people, right? They're like they're not from there. They're not they're from not, there. I know. And, and so they help the community and everything, but it's not the guy who was built, who was you know burning steel, you know, in some factory. He's yeah. gone. So. Those people feel left out. Of course they do. And they're fucking pissed. Of course they are. And they're pissed. And and they're not stupid. They's like for for you know, after from the second world war, from the forties on, that's what I did was important. Like it mattered. They built this fucking country. Country. And now you're telling me it's shit. Right. And so everything is bad. Nothing is good. Nothing is good. America sucks. America sucks. Everything is bad. bad. We're fucking laughing stock of the world. World. We're idiots, you know. And yet you have a fucking iPhone, a fucking penthouse, a fucking two Mercedes Benz. These are the this is how the country looks at these people. You're shitting all over us and yet you're a millionaire. Yeah. So fuck you. I'm voting for Donald Trump. Right. I'm voting him in. Thank you, Doug. And so that's what That's exactly, that was my argument. It was less articulate and informed than you are, but that's the argument I was trying to make. So that's what they I was think. trying to say, like, you know, you know how, you know how I see it is because you talk about Brooklyn and Houston being similar. You're so dead on because you, I just published an interview I had with my father. He lives in Alaska now. He's retired. God bless him. He's 81 years old, but I had him on here and we were talking about Pearl Harbor and air raids and the country and baseball and patriotism and this him this he is part of a group of guys that after world war ii they built this fucking country they were garbage men firemen cops working in factories these are guys that did it every day they and they were the greatest generation so listen i did the play in texas all right so go yeah. all right go ahead man yeah. i just i did it in austin and i had the incredible honor and privilege so I did the play for a theater in Austin, but then this, this retirement community reached out to me and said, would you be willing to bring the play to us? We have a lot of World War II veterans. Wow, man. And I said, absolutely. Fuck, man, we should talk about the play for a second. Okay, we should do it. You want to do? You want to finish the story? I'll do it. So, yeah, I'll tell the yeah, story. Go ahead. And then, By the I, way, just so I preface it for a second, it's called American Soldiers. The American Soldier. It's called The American Soldier. All yeah. right, go ahead. And it's basically... It's basically based on letters from veterans and their families 
written from the revolution all the way through um, current day Afghanistan. Wow. So it takes the experience of the American soldier from the first sip from the Civil War to now. So you'll appreciate this because being from Italian descent. So I try to tell people it's a mosaic of what America, what the American soldier is. I love this, man. It's um, I love it. It's, you know, it's basically a when you think of the American soldier, it's about a bunch of immigrants. You know, immigrants have always been the grunts who have fought in the country from, you know, when the Jews first came here in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, when there's a lot of anti-Semitism, and they all freaking ponied up and went to fight in the First World War because they wanted to prove how American they were to the Italians and Irish and fighting in the Second World War to now, to the Mexican-Americans now who are fighting in the current conflicts. And, and what we forget is that hmm. the immigrants have built and fought for this country. Um, and that's the beauty of the American soldier. It's not just like this white dude. It's really a mosaic. And I play all these different characters. I play like a guy from Brooklyn. I can play a guy from a Hispanic guy with one arm. I play a, a guy from Boston. I play a guy, uh, I play a woman, I play a child. I play um, a, a classic Civil War guy who wrote a beautiful letter. Um, but I try to give this really homage of what war really is and what sacrifice is. But just to finish on this this Austin story. Fuck. So, so I can't wait to talk about the play. Go ahead. So I did this play and they invited me. And so I got to meet, dude, I got to meet a guy who was in a Nazi concentration camp. I got to meet a guy who was part of the Battle of the fucking Bulge. At this old age home. At his old age home. Oh, he my was, God. He, he won't. The, the guy in the Nazi concentration camp was 98. And the guy who was in the Battle of the Bulge was 93. Three or ninety four, I can't remember. Hmm. What was the Battle of the Bulge for the those listening? So the Battle of the Bulge was it was the basically the last German of it was the German last real push hurrah to basically to f- defeat the Allies. They were losing the war, and so basically this Bulge part, which is right on part of the edge of the, I believe it's Belgium. They it's called the Bulge because the Allies were basically they if if you were, if you were to think of a map of Europe, and if you were to draw um, you know army lines you know red for allies and when you would say blue for germans the red line was bulging out the allies were taking ground so they were and so right at the edge of that bulge the germans decided to say that was basically their last real last stand really and so they went all in and and it was one of a very horrific battle and it's called the bloody battle of the and Bo- bloody and it was horrific because the germans were like we're losing too much ground we gotta we, this we, is it this dude. is it this is the this is it this and, is and our fucking this is our uh you know uh trapped animals ready to fight to the death exactly and this is our last stand so and it was in the forest and it was winter and and what's really story about the battle of the bulge is they the tremendous amount of shelling just these guys got shelled to the, I mean, basically the Germans were just shelling. Just unloading bomb unloading after bomb, bomb after, after bomb, bomb for hours. The idea was to break their wind and break the bulge. And how long did it take place? What would you say? Hours of oh, bombing? I, this went on for months, dude. Months. Hours a day. I mean, like it would just like bombard it with that. Well, so, yeah, no. so if it's months. Yeah, no. It's, 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 yeah. So it was insane. It was insane. It was insane. And we would stand it and, and we pushed on and we defeated, you know. You know the evil, evil empires we like to call them, um, and he was part of this fucking battle. And you don't get to meet these guys unless in a history book. I mean, like I was meeting, I was talking to real life history books. It's great, and um, they were amazing. So they must have been so happy to talk to you. They were. Somebody wanted to hear. Yeah, and they and were listen. all grateful. And Imagine they, you carrying that around for seventy years in your brain. Yeah, and well, some <laughs> and, and a guy he told me straight out. He says we never talked about. I he says I didn't talk about the war ever when I came home, ever. That's like that's that uh, that's that defense mechanism. That's PTSD, undiagnosed. And he that's said before they had a name for it. Yeah, he says I never talked right? about. It. Yeah, no, it was called um, in World War II. It wasn't really until after Vietnam that we started really recognizing the effects of. We started labeling the effects of war. World War One, we started World War One. It was called uh, shell shock, and World War Two, <laughs> in Civil War, was called soldiers' courage. And, oh God! And I think in World War Two, it was called. Um, uh, I forgot what is it was that called. where the term shell shocked comes from? Yeah, it comes from. Leave it up to those guys to oversimplify the fuck out of something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was called. Ah, he shell shocked. Yeah, and and then and in Civil War, you, you recall it was called soldier's heart. You soldier's heart. And they thought you didn't have enough courage. Ah, you didn't have a soldier's heart. Oh wow. So um, they literally thought that like you were Oof, like I, kind, I, like kind, like you were genetically not built for war. I'll tell you, like, man, it, I, like anybody's genetically built for I war. I told my wife, man, I was in Williamsburg the other day, and I said, God help us if we need those guys to defend us in a war. Yeah, you. I mean, the, the, you go to Williamsburg, you realize that the the the, the 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 whole place does not have a soldier's heart. <laughs> 
I mean, they're beautiful people. Yeah, <laughs> very creative people. No. Wonderful. No, so the so. <laughs> but nobody has a. <laughs> no, no. Well, you wonder, man. I mean, I mean, th- those are the things. So you know, I just did. I just hope we don't need it. You know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I get letters from. I mean, I get emails, letters. I, you know, the, the play has been incredibly rewarding because I've been meeting connections with go ahead but t- t- uh, just quickly man i want to just set the stage real quick because this is honestly man i fucking love you i feel like i know i feel like we played football together i know and um I feel like, <clears throat> like you're one of my me, boys now if me, and you went, if me and you went to high school together we probably we would be boys yeah we'd be <laughs> yeah. boys yeah. and you'd be you know drunk you know, drunk uh, in ninth grade yeah uh, before you know i would have said throwing up the nurse's office i would have said this is probably not a good idea first of all you would have said faggot <laughs> <laughs> Back then, you were allowed to call a guy a faggot. Didn't mean gay. Didn't no, mean anything. No. Just mean you couldn't handle your liquor. Yeah. Um, yeah, the soldier's heart. You would have been like, bro, you're throwing up? Really? This guy's soft. Um, <laughs> um, so just to set the stage real quick, man. I mean, I have time. I don't care. I love this. I love every second of it. Uh, so you you go to college. I want to set the stage of who you are because this isn't, I mean, it's pretty impressive. Your career thus far is really, really going well. And I'm, it's impressive to me because I'm in and out of the business and I know how difficult it is to stick with it, yeah. to go on a fuck on, on auditions and, and stick with this thing. It's difficult sometimes. So you go to college, you meet a girl, you, you, you love the girl, you fall in love with her or you just, you just, no, you so just I, infatuated I, with her and you wanted to find out more about her and she was yeah, an actress. I, look, look, I'll get to the Breeder Digest version. I was in college. I was, I, I met this girl when I was a freshman. She was a junior. I fell in, I was madly in love. And yeah. the irony of life is that I broke up with her, which is, I, it's a, it's a very powerful lesson. When you think you're in control, that's the, that's the moment for you to realize that you're not in control. Yeah. And after I broke up with her, I, I was destroyed. Why did you break up with her? Because I thought I, I'm you were done. the man. I was the man. I'm done with. I don't her. need her anymore. Yeah, and then the moment she started dating somebody, I'm like, what, what do you mean you're dating but somebody? You said <laughs> you love, love me. Yeah, exactly. I love you, and I realized that. I, was I got so bad that I had to have people come feed me because I couldn't eat oh, anymore. Oh God, men are so sad. Oh. I've been through that. Oh, and to this day, I mean, my when my father passed away, she sent me a Facebook message, and my freaking heart jumped three beats. So she broke your heart. So yeah, I got to college. I, I should, I should, I should also give. I first went to junior college. I went to Angelina and Luf- Angelina College in Lufkin. And I was in class, in English class, and this, I remember this guy named, I'll never forget his name, is Marcus Wiley. Really amazing black actor, and he was just, he was really charming. And then he goes, I'm going to audition for the school play today. And I said, oh, yeah? I said, can anybody audition? And, you know, I wasn't playing sports. I was brokenhearted. I just, you know, I felt like... Wow, I, you were in a bad way, huh? Yeah, I was not good. And so... But, you know, as they say, man, God works in mysterious ways. And uh, he says, is it open? He goes, yeah, it's open. So I went on audition, long story short. I was an alligator. I'll never forget. <laughs> and the, the lady, just, I got cast, and she said, you're pretty good. You know, would you like to do another children play? And I said, yeah. And so I did two children plays. She goes, oh, that's you know, pretty cool. Yeah. So she said, you know. And how you, old are you about? Oh, uh, so I was, uh, 19, 20. Yeah, 20, I guess. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so she said, you know, if you major in theater, I'll give you a scholarship. And that was for a junior college. So I did that. And, and then... Um, and then I was basically hit. And then I'll never forget. So this guy, I even emailed him just recently because. Were you nervous at the beginning acting? No, I never was. You know, I, I don't know why. I, I was always charm. I was always like really, I always like to charm people. So I don't say that in a negative way, but like I love to talk to people. And my dad was like that. I get it from my dad. Yeah. My dad would talk. And you like, weren't my, self-conscious. No, my dad would like, he would be in a, he'd be buying milk and he'd be trying to like have a whole story he talked to the person selling milk and she'd be like, oh, I'm from, you know, I'm from Scotland. Oh yeah, I'm from Argentina. And you know, the Falcon uh, Wars, was, the Falcon <laughs> Wars, you know, and and, and, he, and and I got that from my dad, you know. Now, oh, that's great, man. And so I was never able to, I was never self-conscious. You, you know what's cool about that is that's the outgoing personality. My family's been always, my side of the family, my father's side of the family is always like that. Yeah. Always that, that way, you know. So it's natural. It's a natural progression. Yeah, no, so it was really natural. And so. You're a freak. You don't have the fight or flight thing going on. No, I, and, you know, I think as an actor, I think you have to not have that. Yeah, I, I, I hear myself saying it so many times that I get sick of it. But it is what it is, man. The fight or flight thing. You know, I, I you don't have if you don't have it, you're a freak. That's part of being a good actor. Yeah, I mean, like, um, right. So you know Patrick because you interviewed him recently, but he was like, mm-hmm. so I, I created so from this play, The American Soldier, I was commissioned by the Library of Congress to create another play, and it was based off a soldier, a specific soldier's diary from World War One. Wow. And he was part of the Lost Battalion. What the fuck, man. That's and, fantastic. So I basically read his diary. In six months, I read his diary, wrote a play based off of it, rehearsed it, crafted it, put it up on his feet, and performed it. That's, that's our friend coming in, by the way. Hey, buddy. <laughs> hey, how you doing, man? <laughs> Do you know our friend? 
I have no idea. No. Yeah. I never met him either. Um, we should be afraid. I don't know why he has the key or what he's doing coming no. in here. And if anybody doesn't know visually, he's got a long beard. He's got a long beard. He's a fellow thespian like us. Oh, is he? Yeah. Good. I mean, I you know, I did some skits when I was in high school, but you guys are actors like me too. That's off rim. <laughs> How you doing, man? That's nice that's nice Douglas you. Tellarelli. Totally. Tellarelli. <laughs> he's Italian. I didn't know Doug was Italian. <laughs> No. What's up, brother? Sorry, brother. How, How you doing, you? man? How Good to see you. Our friend just came back from teaching a jujitsu class. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't say anything, dude. <laughs> okay. You good? What do you got? Your Facebook pumping over there? You still, yeah. You still got it going? Yeah, no, I'm just checking. Were you doing it? Oh, yeah. Was it live the whole time? The whole time. See, I don't, I'm, I'm a professional. I don't recognize, you know, one of the things about being a professional actor, and I want you to write this down. Well, when the camera's on, don't look into camera. Okay, guys? Guys, that's Douglas Kendallbound <laughs> yeah, and yeah. our friend Jangalutz. Yeah, uh, our friend, give me a little mic check, mic test. Yo, yo, mic check one, two. What is this? Hanging out with three PLT business. <laughs> How's, how are your headphones? They're good. Oh, I can I can hear myself. <laughs> that was a nice rhyme. Yeah, it wasn't. It was partially stolen. I then. like having inner city city people here because they do the rhyming. Um, call me what I am, urban. I'm sorry, urban. Yeah, urban. fantastic. Yeah, urban. Ur <laughs> we were just talking about urban. <laughs> Urbans. Urbans. These goddamn urbans. I don't like any of them. <laughs> you see the Snoop Dogg? Goddamn. But yeah, I was coming over to the train. I met this. It was pure New York. You know, I met this, um, you know, chubby Asian uh, gay kid. And he was super nice, super kind. And we Fat homo chink. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm just saying that's, uh, <laughs> for those of you in my uh, in my neighborhood, he's describing a fat Homo chink, okay. fat homo chink. Uh, <laughs> this just in. <laughs> TJ's mind. <laughs> well, yeah, we've been talking about TJ's mind. It's like walking through a labyrinth of doors that come out of every corner. Like you're one minute we were we started uh, we started on my show and we ended up talking about my high school football coach. What's that weird that the lady whose house was haunted and she's like we have to continue to make rooms yeah. and this this room doesn't need to make sense. It's just a door that goes to a brick wall. That's that is exactly uh, yeah. it, dude. It's literally like you, you, you hit it on the head dude I've walked into one room one door and then there, as I'm about to I think I'm out of it another door is being created and I'm walking into another door what's that movie you remember that movie that was a oh, fucking stupid movie with a the guy they, they time travel and they, got, they go through their closet <laughs> they go through their closet and their kids and they end up like in you know a thousand years ago and they end up you know it was like an old movie it was an old stupid 1980 movie and they basically the kid found a door in his closet it was a time traveling door and he becomes friends with someone in it sounds like the perfect '80s movie. I was thinking Narnia, but it's no, no, not it's that. not Narnia. It's even it's worse. It's worse. But for this some is exactly reason, I want to do Yo Bethany right now and talk about Yo. That shit is good. You ever heard Yo Bethany? She's a very sassy girl from the Dominican Republic and the Bronx too, and she fucked it at everybody. No, I like her. That, I like her already. That's good. She's sexy and too. <laughs> I love those. When you said that, it reminded me of when my childhood too. My father used to take me to that closet too and take me to a different place. <laughs> <laughs> But he was very loving about it. Y'all act like it's bad or no, something. You're right. I mean, how about like you what's take going the D train on? The Dominican like, girls start young and like, shit, too. He fucked that in my ass and then said that we're going to a different place and don't tell anybody, yo, Bethany. This is between us. This is how we celebrate Christmas. I mean, I mean. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm sorry. Doug? No, 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 I'm just saying, like, <laughs> I'm blown. You know what I'm really blown away by? I'm really blown away by, um, like, Ch Charlie Rose. Charlie Rose, like I am, he he never fucked it in my ass. I would have never said nothing. But to him. he walked around naked, like like you. Wow, like, I can't see. I just can't. I no. mean, I guess I can, but I kind of can't or, see him just doing that shit. Like, where where did he walk around so naked? So apparently, so like it's crazy now. Like the whole world has gone berserk, man. Like like it, it, so right. Yeah, right these now, bitches got to be put back in check, right? No, so, so so right now, what's happened is <laughs> any girl any girl who got fucked over is realize they've got the leverage and they're going to swing the hammer as hard as they can. So every girl that these guys fucked over when they were no one, now they're like, you know what? Now I can speak and I am going to get you. I love every second of it. And I'm going to get you. It's making more room for guys like us to get into Hollywood. Yeah, I hope so. And, and Louis C.K. is out of the picture. I might have a shot at this oh, thing. But, but to me, what's crazy about Louis C.K. Because he was C. really K., talented. There is a void. But there is a void. <laughs> but what's crazy about Louis C.K. So like... Um, uh, some of the other stories, like you know the Bill O'Reilly story, and who, who else is, is happening? Everybody, right? But just throw a fucking but Louis, dart at a Louis C.K. and Charlie Rose. Their stories are creepy. What is it? What did he do? So man? Louis C.K. used to basically have girls come in, and he would masturbate in front of them. 
Okay, but but that's, that's weird. To right? me, that's 1989. But no, but who does that? that? Like, I mean, I would I, like, not me. I would never do that. No, well, but uh, it's people were comparing. In my friend's and basement. I mentioned this a few times. I had this conversation uh, a few to times his with some sister. friends. They were saying <laughs> uh, about like comparing uh, Louis C.K. and Harvey Weinstein, and I was like, well, very it's different. Not, it's not the same because Harvey Weinstein was a real fucking animal because he had a whole network of yeah. people around him supporting this th- weird thing that he would do to the point where it was like contractually written and he also had like uh, people that would s- would set up the scenario to kind of like set up the wo- uh, you know make sure they, they have eyes on the woman that he was trying to victimize and all this it was like a network right but, of, wow, of but, crazy but, shit. but as, oh, as crazy as it is and as crazy, you can understand it because he had power, right? So he, like yeah. he he was trying to get laid all the time. So you kind of, as a guy, you, I'm not condone, I'm not condoning it or anything, but I'm you get it. The Louis C.K. thing is like he had power, but what he would do is he would masturbate in front of girls. No, that's a compulsion. The, that's that, like a bizarre compulsion that it, someone has to do something like that. But it's weird, right? Like, and Charlie Rose would walk around naked in front of people, like. So see, I get the Harvey Weinstein thing. Like, I, I it makes like I that's comprehend a, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a like, um, I comprehend it. I don't comprehend what those two guys on. were doing. Guys, keep talking. So, but you know what I'm saying? This like, slime is not good. Is, oh, <laughs> did I did I F, yeah I I f that no, up. My I fault. Took three sips and said, all right, I think I think I'm good enough now. I think I'm poisoned enough. Yeah, is that what <laughs> that's so what funny. did to the tooth? The it's tooth so is gonna funny. explode. Just throw that out. No, My no, fault. No, I should have no, never kept that there. You don't mind if I do this in the middle. No, it's fine. No, it's great. No, it's just like it's just like beating off without our permission. You're just gonna do it anyway. Be entertaining. So I mean, but so I, I, I when I heard the when I heard those stories, I was more disappointed in what the actions were than the action. Like I was like, why? What? What? Like, like if I was gonna be a dirt bag and I had power, that would not be the thing that I would choose to do. Like I would. I, you know. Also, I guess a majority, a large majority of those stories uh, in regard to Louis C.K. was before he had actually hit. So he wasn't in a position of power. He just, uh, you know, oh, and then so that's, see, a, that's also like neb, like kind of nebulous language. Oh, a position of power. Like he was a male in comedy. I guess you could say that's a position of power, but he wasn't famous then. Oh, so so maybe I don't know. This these story. these were happening, I guess, in a time frame that was. Oh, they won't happen currently then. No, they were like stories that people had heard about. Oh, that's messed up. So I don't know. So Not, the, again, doesn't make it better, but no. I, I think in comparison is like one is one oh, is see, like cream I of the thought, crop piece of shit, Harvey Weinstein, and the other is just like this dude who has like a horrible compulsion, which is anyone surprised if you watch any of his material, you're like, Oh, this dude's a weird beater offer. <laughs> Listen, I know a girl who says that all the women uh need to calm the fuck down. Unless you were raped. This is a woman's perspective. I got to get her in here to say it because coming from me, no, listen, it just sounds I, creepier. Yeah. But she's saying like, <clears throat> like, uh, calm the fuck down, ladies. Every single day of my life, everywhere, always, all the time, always, every guy is trying to fuck me. And, and as a, from a woman's perspective, she's like, she's not saying like she's super hot. What she's saying is that all women go through it all day, every day. It's a way of fucking life. So if you're in a hotel room and a guy pulls his dick out, leave. Like, leave. Don't wait 10 years. This is her words. Don't wait 10 years and say, he jerked off in front of me. You know? She's like, and she was telling me stories. So I thought thought that it was happening currently. So that's even, that's kind of messed up that the guy lost his whole career because. I don't think think so. I don't think he's going to lose his whole career. I I mean, listen, again, probably not. What what we're talking about, too, just anyone listening, it's like there, there can be nuance to conversation. You can talk about something that's uncomfortable and involves. You know uh, all the stuff that we're talking about, and not be in support of it, but being able to question and and speak about it freely. So, you know, if you want to reset your mindset for a second, that's just what we're talking about here. You know what? But, I mean, look at Woody Allen, the guy. People <coughs> love his films. Look at Roman Polanski. People want to sign petitions to bring him back to the United States after banging a thirteen-year-old. You know, <laughs> it's like yeah, you give something yeah, enough time. But in time. his defense, she was hot. Ugh. What? So, American Soldier is the name of the play. <laughs> what a segue. <laughs> That's an amazing no, segue. No, TJ is the master of segues, dude. He's the master. I'm just kidding, fellas. She was ugly. And and the thing is, is um, oh, man. that's what it's unforgiving. <laughs> uh, look, man, we need comedy. Yeah. That's comedy, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I mean, we were that's just talking comedy. about, I mean, so, 
I'm not trying to bring this back to the play, but I mean, no, I love the play. But, but the reason why we we were just talking about why Trump got elected, and the point that you just made right before this amazing segue was that that thank you. Um, you can't. T- By the like, way, that lime is good. Just for the just for the just for the sake apologies. of comment, I want my, you guys to be comfortable. But, but, but you know, no, I thought it would have been fine, but it's not. You can't talk about anything anymore. Like like everything is so taboo in conversation. You don't know who you're going to offend, who you're going to upset. Right. You know, and and a lot of people, and, and I had this conversation. A lot of people. Um, that's another people. That's why they voted for for Trump. Like they're they're exhausted by it, and I, I was just telling them it's my, overkill. It's, it's fucking overkill. to the point where these my so called liberal Democrat friends have become the thing they hate. Yes, you become the fucking thing you hate. So stop the, telling the people far, they can't the far, speak. The far left and the far right are just a mirror reflection it's of each other. It's a crazy other. thing, right? Exactly. Isn't it a crazy thing? So like when the Astros, ah, it's exactly what we said when you came in. When the Strohs, hey now, when the Strohs were playing in the World Series, and that. And uh, he's such a you're such a Houston guy. You call him the Strohs. Guriel said, "Chinito," right to the to Darvish. So you don't know if you remember. And then the World Series. And then it was like a whole thing. He Dude, had you would have thought that he fucking mm, launched a nuclear a missile, missile into the fucking it, middle of Asia. Asia. Right. I mean, like they wanted his <laughs> they wanted his blood. Right. Like people were talking. He should be suspended for the whole World Series. Yeah. He should be fined. Yeah. He should be made to oh, apologize. God, you son of a bitch. It's like, usually the white people too screaming the loudest. No, it was nuts, dude. It <laughs> it's was fucking nuts. crazy. It was absolutely nuts. And as a Houston fan, I was literally sitting there going, you gotta be kidding me. It's we're un- gonna lose the World Series because <laughs> some dude said Chinito in the dugout oh, when, and, and like in every Everybody says everything in the. It's a. It's a. It's a fucking, fucking dugout. dugout. <laughs> Thank like, you. Like what the? <laughs> was it in the church? Right. Like you know. Thank you. Oh my and God. I'll tell you what, and, man. And it drove me nuts. And I was like, so all my boys from back home, we were constantly texting each other. We, and it, they were like, <laughs> and they were like, they were going nuts. And they were like, everybody. Nothing, look how angry he got when it came to his team. Like, leave them the fuck alone. Whoa, they made it to the World Series, series you motherfuckers. Fuckers. And they were like, and all my friends were like, they're not going to do anything. I go, and every radio, and there's some Yankee guy, and he was like, he was calling it atrocious. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. I, and I was like, you're only pissed off because the dude hit a three run homer to knock you guys out. And and I That's was like, atrocious. But meanwhile, fucking A Rod was still getting paid to sit on the sidelines. But think with his fucking jacked up HGHS. But, but ah, let's not worry about Yankee let's not worry fans. about international sex trade about children or anything right. like that. Let's right. just let's worry talk about, about this the guy dude. talking about chinitos. Right. But that's my point. Like the absurdity. You're allowed to own a semi-automatic gun and go berserk somewhere. Yet if you say chinito yep. in a dugout, yep. it, it's like mm-hmm. stop the presses. Stop Welcome to America. It it's fucking you shouldn't say Chinito. Now back to the Redskins I'll game. Tell you what, <laughs> the idea. Well, look, you're touching on something that I fucking. So, it's the reason why I said. Chink, fat homo chink. It's the reason why I say it. You want to know why? Because it's absurd what I'm saying. It's stupid. It's words. When you start doing censorship fucking eats me to my core i don't want to hear it i don't want to hear it you want to know why because international sex trade because they're selling people in africa right now there's slavery going on i saw the fucking bidding yeah it's fucking happening no i know so there's serious shit that hypersensitivity is the death of us it's the death of us it's the reason why you 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 know you talk about louis ck okay man he, it's bad what he did, I guess. It, you know, it, it made the women uncomfortable. There's credence to their story. They felt shitty. He, they had no voice. The guy shouldn't have lost a five picture deal, and all those people are out of work. Like he's not. He's in rape. That's see. That's physically. the thing. That's the thing. No one takes into account. All the people who are working yeah, with him man. who just lost their oh, jobs. Without like, oh, without question. We're gonna punish Louis C.K., but you're really punishing. 200 300 people who have nothing even to more do right with if it. we looked if we really looked at the world as i don't know that we're all somehow related and that we care about each other if you notice your friend doing something people i'd be like tj why the fuck are you can't beating do that. off in a room like you that, can't do man? that man you can't don't do, do that, that. 
Please don't do that again. It's the only thing if that gets me. If you do that again, then we can't, you know. Right. Yeah. 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 So then at least tell somebody to be like, yo, dude, yeah. you can't do that I shit. I mean, one of my boys would have said, Doug, <clears throat> that's kind of nasty, dude. You shouldn't do that anymore. And in fact, if you do it anymore, I'm going to beat your ass. Dude, don't fucking do that, man. Don't do that. Listen, I talked to Jill and Stacy. They said you jerked off in front of them. I'm like, yeah, dude, I don't, you know. That's, that's why would why would you do yeah, that? Yeah, but look, it's a compulsion. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing in his brain. It's the only way he can get off. It's, a, it's like knows, a fetish. It's probably weirdly imprinted in his childhood because that's when people do shit like that it's not like everyone wants to just throw things in these like bundles oh uh this is where someone's doing something this is the power bundle this is the this bundle and it's like yeah maybe the dude was imprinted at a young age and had some weird shit going on and for some reason it like slid it's by it's and the people... way his neurons fire sometimes yeah. it's a gift and a curse when you're that funny and that creative you have a gift and a curse you know what i mean like Always. the way your neurons fire that you know listen man we all have demons like and, and, yeah please and, and, if i if i put all my shit out on the table people who respect me in my life would probably be like oh my god yes and and that might be even me like over exaggerating some of those things but it's like not me and let me hear it no please share it let me <laughs> let what me, is it that let me you hit, do let me hit pause on this yeah, no, let me show you my browser part. history me, yeah exactly let me put it on facebook live incognito <laughs> no but no um, but no but no i listen man i that's everybody i, I just i tweeted i i, I was i going, love that you get that man go ahead i i tweeted when the the, the qb for oklahoma he grabbed his crotch uh I don't know if you, it was, it's like, it's made national news. I saw that. He grabbed his crotch. Well, those guys were fucking with him the whole game. So the game started with him not shaking hands. Now, the guy is a badass athlete. He's ultra competitive. He's talking about a top level quarterback team playing a team that's not ranked and they were trying to get in the guy's head. So in the coin toss, the other team didn't shake his hand. They were being disrespectful. So he was like, all right, motherfucker. Trying to be, do some tactics. It's like a little league team, like going to, you know, they don't shake the hands of the the Yankees or the Astros. And they all on purpose put their hands behind their back like they weren't. So what he did, he scored 30 points on them and during, towards the end of the game when they were taking him out because he was running the score up, he grabbed his crotch and he said, you know, he basically pulled up Fuck you, basically. Yeah, they were cheap shotting him the whole time. Yeah, but I'm like, it's I, football, bitch. Dude, can we work? Can, can we talk about something else? <laughs> right. Can, can we talk about? You, know, you see it, what they do? I mean, you so, see? So, you, so you, so it becomes like. It, it's also we want to we want to like put athletes and all these people, entertainers and stuff, on a pedestal because we see them every day. We feel like, oh my god, I know the most intimate stuff about them. But guess what? They're people. They're yeah. athletes. The athletes. I'm sorry. They're not. A lot of them dude, aren't the highest yeah, on the academic think, scale. But, but do we think? And do we think the Steelers in the 1980s didn't say some shit? Oh my God! They were fucking vicious. Did, did, they don't, there was did, no inter- internet to they, document all the they were plethora vicious. of, they of were vicious. sexcapades they and drugs vicious, that was happening. Man. They when were vicious. When you say plethora, do you mean a plethora of petunias? Ah, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> because I, you know, I, excuse my intellect, uh, uh, Hefe, but I am, don't, um, I don't know if you. Uh, I am don't. I love that. <laughs> I, I don't know if you if you upset with me, but um, uh, could it be because um, Carmen hasn't opened her flower to you? Oh, sorry. oh, very nice, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what that was, but I liked it. It's from a Three Amigos. Of course it was. <laughs> I don't really get out too much and see movies and stuff from 30 years ago. Well, that's part of the joke is that Bruno and Michael tell you I don't have reference to a lot of movies. I know Raging me, Bull very, very well. Let me tell you, I'm so sick that I can watch that YouTube clip over and over and over and over. It's of the, that? It's the funniest. It's one of the funniest cinematic moments in I think cinematic history. Really? I oh, think about it, dude. Oh, comes, I don't know. They say, Hefe, yes, El Wapo. Is, um, uh, there's, we, we've got a, a happy birthday for you, and we have a, a, a plethora of petunias. When you say plethora, do you mean a plethora? Why do you say plethora? Are you upset with me, Hefe? You seem to be very upset with me. I, excuse <laughs> me, but I do not have your intellect and your education, but uh, could, could you please, um, could it be because you're upset because Carmen doesn't open her flower to you. <laughs> I love open her flower to you. And when you, you said plethora, you couldn't make that movie today, man. Oh no! It reminded dude. me of one of the women in my family. They try to sound smart, but they talk like this. And all I can tell you is that there's a plethora of opportunities for you, honey. When you say plethora, I want to know if you know what a plethora is. I just. Love I'm it. sorry, honey. It's a plethora. So I. I'm kidding. And I said, "What the fuck is she saying, plethora?" What is the plethora? Is it a dinosaur? What is she saying? So what you, I was like, oh, pl- plethora. So what did you talk about, Doug? Uh, the show? No, uh, uh, Three Amigos. Yeah, we did Three Amigos and 
TJ was highly offensive in every door of his brain. <laughs> every door. Yeah. Um, yeah you, so, so anyhow, Amer- goes on. how does American Soldier fit into the American Soldier? The bro. American Soldier fit into bro, that. It, it's it's actually really powerful. No, I was going to say, and that's why he's going to tell you about it. Ta- <laughs> and, and what we were just talking about, like how certain things couldn't be made today, or uh, well, you know, it's funny subject cause, matter a content because just through the title, you would assume that it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, and, and and it's not. So the play is really a mosaic of what the American soldier is. It's really, it's it's basically immigrants, grunts. So I play like a Hispanic dude with one arm. I play a guy from Boston. I play a guy from um, Brooklyn. Uh, I play a woman. I play um, a father who loses her son. So the idea of the American soldier is that the American soldier, what we consider the American soldier, is a mosaic of all the immigrants that have come together and made the American soldier. And yeah, it's not the 1940s or 50s. Uh, <laughs> sign up for the... Uh, America wants you. Yeah, America wants you, you with your comb over hair. No, and, and that's, <laughs> and, you know, and what's, what's amazing is that when people see the play, that's, they get that through line. They're like, wow, it's a very powerful play because it's really, it's a play about veterans and what veterans go through and the incredible commitment and sacrifice they make that we just don't really understand. Like, what is it to give up your only son or to lose a father or to lose uh, a mother or to go off to war for three tours and leave your family by themselves and have them come back and try to struggle financially? You know, what what is that? You know, when we say thank you for your service, we should know what that commitment really has been and currently is today. So that's always a powerful message and that I try to I try to share with people. And also there's some powerful things about, you know, the military, you know, discipline, brotherhood. But it was, uh, it was based on letters written home yeah. from from soldiers starting from the Civil War up until Afghanistan. Revolution. From the um, revolution. Revolutionary War. Wow. So, so, so Unbelievable. And you created this, right? Yeah. This was your creation. Yeah. And we started talking about how you acted in, in college and you got a few play, uh, plays and then. Um, but up until this point, you've been on television. You've done some some TV shows and yep. movies, right? So when did you start it? And what and how did you? So what I started was the inspiration. So I it? started the play eight years ago because I kept reading in the newspaper. Um, I, I should just we're not going to let TJ talk because every time I every time I start telling the story, he takes me into a door, and I never get to finish the story. I'm going to try my hardest. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yes. Oh, I could just thought you fucked it in my ass. <laughs> Now, so, as soon as he starts, I'm like, ah, my uh, father okay. was in the war too. So the play, because my father, uh, I'm, my my parents are immigrants, and so my dad's from Argentina, was from. He Argentina, was in a Colombia. gang war with the warriors, and, the real warriors, and, and, and in he, the Bronx, 1975. And he was really patriotic because he was very grateful for what the country provided for him, and so he he kind of instilled the patriotism for me, which is very true to today. Most immigrants are probably the most patriotic. Uh, Americans that you'll ever meet uh, from Jews, Italians, Irish, wherever, you know, from wherever you're from, even today, you know, even, even the Muslim community, except for the Chinese, let's be honest. They don't give a fuck about nothing. (laughs) I I don't plastic bottles and 90 people. I think especially that first generation that comes here and then they, they have children in the States, which is exactly my family, you know, traditional Albanian Muslim family, you know, super uh, appreciative and you know, so What's well, the only opportunity? It's, it's, it's the opportunity you get. I mean, they they're given an opportunity. You know, they come here for for a better life, and they they get it. And you know, like, listen, my dad had an eighth grade education. Only in America could a a son of a man of eighth grade education go to the Kennedy Center and the Library of Congress and get a college education. It wouldn't happen anywhere else. Yeah, it's like incredible. It, it wouldn't happen yeah. anywhere else. You, mean you started this eight years ago. You started the process. Yeah, eight years even ago? probably longer. But yeah, so I started collect. So I would read in the newspaper when we were heavily into the Middle East how these guys were coming back and they were struggling with their bills uh, and PTSD. And there's one particular story that a guy, he couldn't pay his bills. So what he would do is he'd knock on his neighbor's doors and he'd do odd end jobs to pay for his family. And I, I thought that was kind of fucked up. I thought that was it's really insane. I thought that was fucked up that you can go over there, take shrapnel on your ass, come back and you can't pay your bills. And that we as a country, and the sad truth is- That's insane. The sad truth is that's been the story of our country from- it happened in the revolution. That is fucking insane. That we should have billions of dollars set aside for them. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the fight right now. But I it mean, should be. But that happened, and you know, the and con- me too for saying that because I just want people to know that there I'm was, behind uh, them. When, and I should get a few dollars for it too. When you, know, you mentioned Doug? PTSD, yeah, um, there was a a book that um, I've been meaning to read uh, by Tyler Boudreaux called um uh, uh, packing inferno i think oh, hold on a second let me take a look but anyway he talks he's uh, he was a 12 year uh marine that uh retired and started writing he wrote this book he like does does plays and whatnot very uh similar to what you're talking about but when he references post-traumatic stress 
disorder, I think he, um, one of the things he mentioned is like taking off the, the D at the end. So it's just yes, post traumatic stress, stress because, because, because it's not a disorder. Yes, correct. exactly. Correct. That is very correct. I mean, they, they, that's a big deal right now. Taking really? Off, taking off the D. Sorry. Um, no, no, no I, I, I don't I, want it to fall on you. I'm about to knock the off speaker. the speaker. But, but, um, <laughs> so listen, so about eight years ago, so you're reading these articles. So I would, so I would read in the newspaper and I, I just, so I wanted to do something. Um, I, the, I got this sense of patriotism from my father being an immigrant. And so I wanted, I really wanted to tell the story of what it is our veterans go through. And so I started, and so the play really, and I'm, I'm a huge history fan. Like I, and it's funny, as you get older, you become your dad. Like my dad used to watch Nazis at war over and over and <laughs> over and over, you know, and especially as a Jew, like you, you weren't even allowed to have like, um, <laughs> you weren't even allowed to have a, a you know, you know, anything German in the house. Like he was, I mean, it was crazy. He was like, you know, nothing German. Um, he know. was a little hypersensitive about it. He was a little bit hypersensitive. Yeah. Yeah, people get like that sometimes. Jew bastard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so he was a history guy. And so, and so, and I so become, was his son. Yeah. And, but it's a natural in- interest. In so it. yeah, and so I became really interested in history. So I would, so I started, I, I said, you know, I'm going to do a little workshop. I'm going to, I'm going to look up veteran letters and I'm going to just, you know, and I'm going to do like a tiny little bit of a workshop of it. And I started, the more I did it, and the more what I got into it. What do you mean workshop? It. What's a workshop? Basically, you know, get a small little space, and I'm going to read a bunch of letters about veterans, and and you just do it for a group, handful yeah, of people, and yeah, just... a handful of friends, you know. Yeah, okay, people, cool, whatever. And um, this was in New York. You were in New York at the time, or yeah, I've I've always been in Hoboken. Hoboken, always. but I mean in the, in in the city, yeah, in the city, right? Yeah. Okay. And th- long story short, is the more I did it, the more people responded to it. And people were saying, "Wow, well, I, mean, I think you're onto something there." Do you remember the first one, the first workshop? Uh, yeah, the first workshop was where was the fr- was in my living room. Huh, cool. It was in my living room. Same I, letter. I, I no. I, so the play was very heavy on the revolution, and what was crazy about it, the, which is very true now, and we won't get down that rabbit hole. But the guys in the revolution also got screwed. So they they came back and and the country was like we don't have any money because the country was just being formed so they didn't they were broke basically so they <laughs> we just formed a federal government we you know we were trying to figure out what that the currency time was, was so crazy so crazy so they, these soldiers came back and the, the government had you know the the United States the the thirteen colonies had basically promised them all this money I mean that's why the whole story of Valley Forge because all these how, guys were broke how many years were were America were the first group of settlers here before the revolutionary war because oh, so the idea 1600s yeah from the 1600s so, so right? the story a couple of, hundred years at least if right? you want to know the story of america the story of america's uh wealthy land merchants came from the early 1600s and the idea was they were going to establish a, a business trade right and they were basically indebted to the, to the to the great britain so they would so great britain paid for them to come over here that's what started it so they rich guys came here and they would bring and religious and they would bring women and, and very slowly but surely they would bring like women to make the voyage more comfortable. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So basically you started families that way. And well, they, yeah, yeah. So uh, and they would get pregnant. Pregnant. And here and we go. Hundred years later, you know, 1760s, we're like, you know, why are we paying taxes to these people? And so what it, are they going to do? They're all the way in fucking Britain. And Britain said, well, we're going to go to war with you. And so that's basically, that's the that's American the revolutionary Re- war. That's the revolution. The whole idea that this is taking place on somebody in somebody else's country, the Indians is hysterical to me. It's yes. like fucking the human race is so insane. Well, we, <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, like, we, we almost have, no consideration that, <laughs> right. No, we, well, there was consideration, but you know what I mean? Not much. No, well, they were, not they much. Were, you know, they were, they were just godless savages. animals. And they, were they, were they were in the way. Given, they uh, were in the way. Yeah. Wow. We erased them in the West crazy we just went see ya but you know i talk about the indians because uh the i i would say if if there was though that was wrong it it is a law of nature that the native americans didn't follow which is true today it's going to be true to us everything that if you don't change with progress progress erases you basically and that's been true from the uh, the Egyptians to the Romans when they when they don't ad- they when they don't adapt to change right from lead poisoning from changing of wars it's an interesting way to look at it progress nature the the unforgiving bestiality of nature erases you you must be able it's to Darwinism it's it really is it really is so the Native if you Americans don't evolve you will be changed you will be changed and I think a lot of it is when you study history you released you know you study a community that they wanted though beautiful they wanted to hold on to a way of life that it was theirs you know and they didn't understand this modernization of mechanism of guns and disease and all these things and to a degree a lot of them were resistant of it you can't 
you know, I mean, ideally what you Native Americans say, you know, we want to be involved. Now, though, we did some horrific things as, as white settlers. And, hey, I think they underestimated the evilness of fucking the people that were coming. Well, that's true in South America, everywhere. I mean, I mean, basically everywhere. everywhere. Every, exactly. When yeah. I say, and I'm not even being specific about a race, I'm talking about the people, yeah. you know, because it happens in every well, culture and every. People, yeah. Most of the people who are native to the land that they're in, when someone else comes in, typically there's an element of ambition that comes with that because Correct. the people who are already there right. they're like oh i'm good and life it's a is, new thing and good. It's we're exciting. living off the land we're it's doing exciting. these people thing. need us they need our they, and that might even can... be a romanticization of what they were doing because you know correct but, no you hit it on yeah. the head dude i mean that's it that's it so but so i started I, so i workshopped the play <clears throat> and people were like and so they read it and you know it was bad i mean it was bad I mean, it was I and mean, there was needed but, to be refined but but there was moments there was moments in it that people said um Dude, that's that one part. That one part you read was really powerful. You know, I didn't like all the other stuff because it was a very heavy revolution. And it's a consensus, so people would say people would latch on to one part. One, one part. Because I'm thinking, why you workshop something is to see if it's good or not, and see what needs to be done. It's yeah. like a comedian working out material. I almost. literally, you know, it is. I literally, I bought pizza. I bought three pizzas, and I invited like four people who I trusted. <laughs> that's cool. And and a, and a couple of other friends. I had six people, and I sat there with a little makeshift music stand that my wife had when she played flute when she was in college huh. and I sat there and I started reading the play for about 30 minutes and it was very different from what it is now and um, anyhow as I kept working on it that's great and I kept reading it I, st I would literally go to the New York Public Library and, and research books I would literally pull books of letters and, wow, and you got pulled into it yeah and you start and you, and you start falling in love with it. you start reading stories and you're reading amazing stories you know and t to be honest with you these are some of the most compelling stories you can read not necessarily any veteran stories, I mean, from any war, from anybody, because they, you know, people who experience war, whether it's general civilization or or or, uh, or army combatants, they they experience life at a very primitive level. You know, yeah, it's they, every, it's very absolute. There's it's, something about <laughs> letters too that's yeah. a little bit lost on it's true. our current generation. That yeah. <laughs> I mentioned yeah, this la I mentioned this last time, but I'm like kind of in that mid range where half my life was without technology. So I remember writing letters. To people and were you, you born would, here? Were you born? I was born. I was born here in the states in Brooklyn. Um, so why I, didn't you have technology? No, we. I mean, just not like internet and stuff like oh, that. Oh, I'm, I'm oh, okay. thirty. I'm thirty four. So okay. when I was younger, we didn't have that. I mean, we had Nintendo and stuff like that. But when it came to write, like yeah, not, uh, not like it is now. It's not. Yeah, right. not like how where. Oh, hey, I want to figure. I want to. How do I drive here? Punch it in ways. How, <laughs> right, oh, what, what's right. this thing? Dude, Google. It's so, it's so true, man. So I'd write. I'd write letters, crazy, and I remember right? you would think about it. You would kind of toil. Like, oh, what's this thing I want to write? And then you'd write it, then you'd send it, and it was kind of that excitement. So imagine in a world that was way before, a soldier who's in constantly a uh, life or death stress situation, he, it, those words are chosen specifically, full of emotion, full of so my, gravitas. My and all Civil that. War letter guy, he's, he's amazing. He's so eloquent. And he was the, he's the only guy in my play that is. You're talking about a real soldier. A real soldier. His name is uh, uh, Sullivan Ballou. He was in the Ken Burns documentary. His letter is very well known. It's called the uh, Dear Sarah Letter. Um, and he has the first four lines are the most beautiful. He says, Dear Sarah, the indications are strong that we shall be moving in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. Lest I should not be able to write you again, I feel compelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eyes when I shall be no more. Oh, wow. And you're like, how do you compose those letters, those words, you know? And then he goes on to saying, That's if, fucking poetic. If I should fall on the battlefield for my country, I am ready. I have no misgivings or lack of confidence for the cause in which I am engaged. And my courage does not halt or falter, for I know how strong the American civilization now leans upon the triumph of our government and the great debt we owe those who went before us through the blood and sufferings of the American Revolution. And I am willing perfectly willing to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt and you think jesus how does anybody compose words like that first but, of all that was you did it really well because you shut me the fuck up <laughs> <laughs> you had me that's like that was really gripping man you became the guy that's great and you, yeah how do you and so like how do you have that mindset, mindset and then to, and then to put to it to in say those, that to say so that, eloquently that i am willing to give up everything i love he goes on towards the end. Everything I love for th for this cause, like this cause is so important to me that I am willing to give up my son, my wife, all the joys in my life. Wish I can go back and show him these guys kneeling for the flag. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean, fellas? He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't he do was, it. Yeah. 
No. So, all right. So, go ahead. <laughs> No, but you know, in a, in a way, I mean that that and that could be that could be a whole other thing. But in a way, that's one of the the for one day I know a black things. Negro worth fifty million dollars will not respect the flag I'm about to die for. He had no. Someone flashed the future in his eyes. It's like an ungrateful Negro. Sarah, has changed, I'm coming home, baby. Dearest Sarah, an ungrateful Negro has changed my mindset. So <laughs> no, no, but so but yeah, so that's my play. I'm sorry, dude. I, I'm I thought you shut me down. You didn't. Just just for I'm gonna go back. One of the rooms the, opened up. Let's close it real <laughs> yeah, let's quick. Let's close it. All right, lock, lock that one out. Lock that one. Throw man. the key in the garbage with the shitty lime. Go ahead. Uh, whatever TJ says is not a part of the American soldiers. You know. I'm sorry. Yes, it is. It, we, it's a. It's the after story. It's you have to stay. It's the after show. Post credits. Yes, post credits. But so I, you know, so I, as I, so you read those words. So as I would come across these letters, and I would hear letters, and then I got to a point where everybody was just like, you know, you you you, you should do this, you know, and and so I, I it got it got deeper and deeper, and I got it got to a point where it was getting overwhelming. So I, I said, you know what. I'm going to take this into a solo show workshop. I'm going to take some playwriting classes. And I took some playwriting classes. And I always had this idea that I wanted to do a play about veteran letters. But at the time, it was going to be a play. I had no freaking idea what I was going to do. Wow. Like, I was literally in the abyss. I mean, you were working steady as an actor at that time? Huh? No. I mean, it was personal training. You know? Wow. And it's always been a passion project of mine, you know? And um, as I, I, just the more I worked on it, man, the more I kind of... Um, I lost my fucking that door opened up. Yeah, I fucking know. Day. I'm here. I'm here for you. It's like you need, I'm here for you. Like we'll I, get back there. It's like I need MMA and podcast <laughs> defense. <laughs> no, it's not defense. Just come with me. Come. We'll get back to that. Yeah. Trust so, me. So I took a playwriting class, and so and then I remember I took. Yeah, you went right back to it. Craig, you didn't trust yourself. You yeah. didn't want to go down that road. You went yeah, right back yeah. to it, didn't you? That's a good defense move. It is. That's called um, Fight, not having fight or flight. Uh, that's uh, the art of fighting without fighting. Yeah, <laughs> the art of fighting without fighting. But Thank so you, yeah, oh, and, but you know it was crazy because I would go up to directors orale. over and orale, pendejo. Um, <laughs> I would go up to I would go. I mean, I would go up to directors and I would say, Hey, I have this fucking stack of veteran letters. I want to create something with it. And they'd be like, um, What? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, what, yeah. Like, what do you want to do with that? What do like, you want from me? I don't know. I want you to help me create it. Do it. Yeah, get back to me. And like, you know, everybody's like, I mean, they were like, no one had a clue what to do with it. Yeah. And, and they were like, it's so because you know when you talk about the idea of creating a play about war, I mean, you can go in so many fucking directions, man. I mean, you there's can, so many stories, there's, there's so, so many, many layers. stories and so many things. What do you want to talk about? You know, what what is it? You know, it's it's like a it's like an ocean, and. um so mm -hmm. I, I took a I took so and so and so on. I took a playwriting class, and with Craig Lucas, and I, I mentioned who he was, and he was really inspirational. He's a good friend of mine, Craig. Yeah, he's really inspirational. I have no idea who he is. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> who's Mike Craig? He's my boy. Tell him TJ said hello. But he was really inspirational. He was because, great, right? Yeah, because he said, you know, he said, don't give up on the play, don't give up on the project. You, you'll find a way. And I love guys like that, yeah, man. And he said, you know, you know, you should look at every avenue. It might be a solo show. And I was like, it seems like it. It's evident at that now. It seems evident. Yeah, but you now don't know seems, at that. You back don't know it back then because you you don't know what crazy. So and I took that a, like was that was that the moment you were like, oh, yeah, it is a fucking solo show because yeah. I care so much about it. Yeah, exactly. And I started realizing, you know what? I think he's onto something. So I took a solo show workshop. Same thing, man. And then and then you know it, it starts getting more condensed and you know and it was still bad. You know, I mean, I I have the recording when I first did it. So at the end of the workshop, you have oh, to wow. perform it. I love that. <laughs> I love the recording. <laughs> Yeah. And I watch it and, and I'm like, I, I get my, my hairs on my back. cringe, bat, right? Cringe. I'm like, oh my yeah. God, people, I made people sit through that. <laughs> I'm crying in these horrible places. And you know, you're like, oh. And I, I even, I even, I, I, I even went to a costume. Oh shit, I'm gonna knock that shit over. Yeah, I, I even went right. to the costume shop and I got an old Civil War jacket. I'm like, it was bad. Don't bad. do it. Don't no, do you it. Don't but you have the it. guts to do it. And yes. then there's one of two choices. You either cringe to the point where you're like, I'm hiding in a cave for the next five years so yeah. nobody can associate me with this thing. Or, but, like, all right, I'm going to take I love this the bravery and make it, of make it. it yeah, better. Yeah. Right, right. But, I love the bravery of it. Fuck but it. what happened from that, hor and you know, it's true with any process, you have to, it's kind of like this podcast studio. It's got to suck first. Like it's, right. So you can know where you're going from it like right you know, when you first guys got together you're like oh, that's horrible you know and yeah and i'm sure right. and i'm sure you yeah. listen to each other and like yeah dude we're, we're not i mean i listened to the other guys really were bad i was always as good as i am right now yeah you know? that's why i'm I always came in way level. later because, because i was like it's finally good it's now. finally good and i can ride the coattails <laughs> oh, of all dude, this stuff you're so right man you, you, if you would have seen us at that fucking computer with those horrible microphones you're all, yeah you, absolutely like you're hearing absolutely you're hearing like woo, 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 woo. <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> woo, woo. Shh. 
Fuck is and I'm like, no, I'm going to do a character now. The yeah. character's going to be funny. You say this and I'll be at the bus stop. Right. right. Lean, lean. You're like, fucking get some recording. I swear to God, this is the noise. Watch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what that is? That's the neighbor's uh, air conditioner. Yeah, exactly. In Bruno's house. It's the ambient hate. It's in the, the air. ambient hate. But from sucking, <laughs> I, I was able to develop oh like a God. monologue. And I had a monologue in my head. So then, and it's really true, and it's like anything in business. It's not, and and I when I talk, I also write for Backstage. I write a monthly column, and I always tell people, what you need to always do when you're creating something is to create a product. Because you can't sell ideas. It's really hard to sell an idea. What does that mean, a product? So, so you, if you, if, if you want to sell a film, right. the best way to do it, yeah. in my opinion, is to create a short film of that film. And say, this is my film. And this is the idea I have. I ha- I see it in 60 minutes or 120 minutes. So so create like a 20 or 15 minute version that has a beginning, middle and end. Because if you don't, right? what you're doing is you're selling someone on. I have this idea of this guy going and like, okay. Yeah, the idea is it, not it's, tangible. It's vague. It's, it's, in, the, it's, it's in, the in the air, air right? It's, it's in and the you ether. can't latch on to it. I mean, it yeah, happens. Yeah. It's like the lottery ticket. It happens. People latch on to ideas. But, you know, it's not until you actually or, or it could be just write the script. Like you have to write the script and say, read that. Right. Yep. Read the script and make the first 15, 20 pages unfucking believable where they say, all right, you know. So and same thing with a with a theater, with a play or a solo show. Interesting. I can't find a director until I had a monologue that I could go audition to directors for until I started auditioning to directors. And I found Patrick. I said, I have a monologue. I heard you're a director. I'd like to pay you for your time. I'm going to pay you 100 bucks to come see me at Simple Studios. I'd like to pitch a project to you. You know, and if you like it, we can talk. Did and he that, take the hundred bucks? He definitely took the hundred bucks. Shit, where did I talk to him? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fucking he animal. took it without a without a blank. Actually, that's yeah. why he's one of the few guys that are surviving in the was business. Was it like, like, was right, it like the audition? The was it like the audition process? He was just his head down. It was in a notepad, and then no, after, no, after you're done, he, he after you're done, he just walks out. He's like, right, I'll get in touch. <laughs> oh no, 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 he, <laughs> no. I'm joking. I know Patrick. That's so great. He's no, awesome. No, I'm just you described the the fucking the process so well. It makes it hurts my heart. Yeah, I I can tell you some horror auditioning story yeah. but um but no so he saw he saw what i had as a product and he said yeah i'm kind of interested in that that's pretty you know it's pretty good and i had been working on this bad monologue for a while so it was good already you know the bad monologue had become good and i did 10 minutes for him you know so it's an easier sell right for me and, and it was a very it was a learning process as a producer and i do that now all the time where i, I realize if i want to create a project and i want to bring someone on board i have to create a product first so the mistake I was doing before I found Patrick was I was going I was trying to sell an idea to directors. That's what I was going to ask you. What was bad and what what how did it turn out good? You understand? Like I mean, what, how, how did, like I know it's too nuanced and maybe too many details to really cover, but you how do you know like a monologue is bad? How do you know one's bad and one's good? Like a, a good monologue hits the points when they're supposed to hit and everything is it like editing? Yeah, it's, it's like, like editing. It's editing. You know, it's lang- editing. You know right. the language wasn't good. Like, you know, at one yeah, point, yeah, you know, yeah, at okay. one point, it was too long winded. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the structure wasn't right. You know, and and he Patrick was the first guy to say, you know what? Because at that time, all I had was guys. You know, because what this play is missing is balance. You know, you don't like have like any- this fucking podcast. We need some bitches in here, bro. That would be awesome, naked. And by bitches, I mean females yes. that like to be called bitches. Well, technically, they're actually here already, but they're just not allowed to speak, what? so we can look. <laughs> So he was, yeah. he he had the foresight enough to know that you needed a woman in there. I'm looking right now. Hold on. <laughs> hey, <Okay>. baby. <laughs> but yeah. The, no, sound, so, the sound of No, looking. he said, he goes, I want you to go back. And at that time, I'm, I'm fast forwarding a lot, but at that time when I found Patrick, I had been working on this freaking disaster of a play for like seven years. A different years. play? No, this play. This I'm, one? Well, the American Soldier. Well, you were I'm calling not, it a disaster at yeah, that time. Yeah, it because was, it was. It was a disaster. It was exhausted. It was becoming overwhelmingly that I wanted to produce, and I couldn't find the right people to help me to do it, and I didn't know how do I want to tell. Like it's, it's just this horrible obsession that you have that you want to do. It's hard when you wear too many hats, man. Yeah, and well, you don't know what to do with it, right? And it's not like, is it a play? Is it a solo show? Is it a film? Maybe it was. A, maybe this is a film. You know, maybe this is a film, you know? Or maybe it's a short film, or maybe it's a stupid idea. You know, maybe that's what it is. You start second guessing. Yeah, yourself. you start second guessing. Like no one's believing it. I don't believe in it. Every once in a while. So when I, by the time I found Patrick, you know, it was through a referral of a friend who I did a, a workshop with. She said uh, he's really good with solo shows. And so when he said, "What you need to go do now is research. You need to go find some kids and some women." I'm like, "Oh, dude, I'm so tired of research. I can't do any more research, Patrick." And he's like, 
you, you need balance. He said, the play, just go find three or four monologues from women, find for some from kids, we'll shape, we'll craft it together. We'll take, you know, let's, let's get back together like in three, in, in three months. It's cool that he, a, a good director. Yeah. You know, he's a it, good director. Yeah, he knows it, that. And he was really, I think, I, and I, I, I emailed this to him. I think the, his biggest strength as a director, he's really good at blocking and spacing, but his, his biggest strength is giving the artist belief that what they're doing is a worthwhile project to do. And that's huge, confidence. Because that's everything. It's, it is. Because if, if he goes, you know, Afrin, that's a really good idea. And I think that project needs to be told. Then you get inspired to keep going, right? You're also not afraid to fail if you start pushing because he, you have someone that's going to And then back. Failure, failure almost becomes something that you don't even think about anymore because you're, it's like you're halfway to success because he believes in you. Yeah, I mean, you... That's f- cool, right? Yeah, you feel like, oh, no, this is not a bad idea, which is half the battle. It's not a bad idea. So, okay, now I can keep working, right? But if you think it's a bad idea, like, then the work becomes drudgery, right? Because then you're like, why am I wasting my time on this? This is not a good idea. It's like anything, right? When you don't believe in it, it's like this. The, re- the reason why they tell you to do something that you love is because the work, like Steve Jobs said at the best, it is so freaking hard that if it's not something that you love, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. You're just not going to do it. And yep. they seem like a... I guess I was going to say it might seem like a weird question, but the, my thought is what have what have people's reactions been? Because I'm very curious, maybe um, people from different political spectrums watching it, what's their response great to it? It's a great question because I've done the play. That's why I told them to ask it before we started. I was telling them to ask that. Th- it's amazing. Dude. Thanks, Thanks TJ. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i do the other ones also. When <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes. So I did the – for September was a really busy month for me because I, I, toured, the, I toured the show in, in – um, in Kansas, Connecticut, and Virginia, three very polar opposite, three op- very different demographic yeah, yeah. states. Um, Connecticut is very liberal, um, almost hippie liberal, and I mean I know Connecticut has had some really conservative areas, but on the, on the whole, it's pretty it's pretty liberal. And then uh, Kansas, which is about as <laughs> red as it gets, and Virginia. And Virginia's a, Virginia's weird because that's where Bernie Sanders is from. But Virginia is a mixture. It's really. Even though it, 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 it tends to go blue, but it's really purple. It, it's a really mixed state. But the play, you know, the way people in a liberal part of the country take it is like, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we need to find a way to how to end these conflicts. And the way they take it in a conservative part of the same play, same actor, the way they take it in a conservative parts of the country is we should do more to basically help our soldiers. We need to talk about our soldiers we need to help them we need to honor them more the liberals are looking at the root cause of the war correct and they're both very valid though they're very valid i mean if you've I mean, you can't study vietnam and not think what a waste you know i mean like just sure what a waste most wars yeah well i mean you would say most, most. you would say not, not all but most. but it's interesting how some are necessary play can find a uh, kind of a the discussion it creates in this middle ground yeah. because you're, you're noticing that there's all these, these people of different political affiliations are having deep connection to the play. So then what is then the common so the com- connector, so, which is interesting. Uh, to and me. I, and I talked about it. I just did a discussion for Thomas. I should also, you know, share, I mean, Thomas Edison military Academy has been incredibly supportive of this project. They they're sponsoring a web series that I'm creating and the military times has also been supportive, really supportive of the play. They believe in the process of the project and they believe in the message of the play. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But I did a, a, a they invited me to do a discussion on war. Uh, they were having a workshop, uh, Tom, uh, uh, Thomas Edison Military Academy. And so I did it. And what the, the f- there was a really nice gentleman there. He goes, you know, you have an, an amazing ability because you've been traveling the country around and you've kind of been doing focus groups with people without even knowing on purpose. Because after the end of the show, at the end of the show, people always come up to me. They want to talk yeah, to me. Yeah. They want to ask me, are you a veteran? You know, how, you know, and they, sh- and they, and they share their personal stories or their father's personal stories or their wives' personal stories. So I get this, a very wide, I mean, like I said, I've talked to people who are in Battle of the Bulge or I've talked to people who are opposed. I, some lady said, I remember going to the wall and opposing the war. Like very different mm. spectrums, but they the one common thing, and I and I think, and I think that's the problem with the country today. That everyone at some point in this country was connected to the military in some way, whether you were had someone fighting in a war or you or you knew someone fighting in the war. So the military today is only one percent of our po- it's less than one percent of our population. So what's happened is the by not having a, I, I kind of believe that we need a self-imposed draft. Doesn't mean that I want everybody to go fight for a war, 
but you got to have skin in the game to care about the game. So you lose like, appreciation for what they do. Well, I think. no, it's also is that if me and Afram, I can tell that we're from very different backgrounds in some ways. But if we both said, "Hey, I," if, if there was a, if there was a mandatory draft like Israel, Iran has one, a lot of countries have one, and then you don't have to be a combat force, but you have to. At eighteen, you have to give a year to your country, and I think I, I don't see why not. Right. And, and I believe so. I mean, him say, well, what were you stationed at? You know, what was your where was your your mandatory military commitment? You're like, oh, I was in uh, uh, Atlanta. Oh, I was in Atlanta, too. So now we have a common. Oh, I, right. I, I, you know, we have a common language. Right. We may disagree politically, but we have something in common, something in common, which was in the past generations. What I believe is that those guys, everyone had something in common, even if you were opposed for a, against a conflict, you, you had a family member who had someone going off the war. That's war. missing. That's missing. It's gone, me. right? I think so it, it's I, I gone. Would, I would agree with you. I think also a, a version that I heard, and I'm drawing a blank as to where I heard it, but a version of that would be, it's just called man, um, mandatory service in the sense that it doesn't have to be military service. But at 18, yes. you, you must, it's required that you give a year towards some form of service, whether it's military service or, let's say, AmeriCorps, or you have to volunteer for structural integrity to, like, rebuild bridges or something that gives you that year to say, like like you said, hey, there's some connect. Oh, what'd you, what'd you do for your mandatory it's service? Really, exactly. It's really a good concept. And that it's, would be it brings humility cool and Cause, appreciation. Because then if someone's, let's say, a conscientious mm-hmm. objector or they're just like, hey, you know what, I, I don't. You, you, you can respect them more because they have skin in the game, right? Yes. They're not coming from left field, like, right. you know, and, and though it's valid, so what happens is to people, like, let's say, if you go back where I'm from in Houston, they have complete disrespect for anybody who is posing anything in the military who is from let's say a part of New York who has no connection to the military, right? And it's wrong on their part to disrespect that because they're not listening. But you understand why they're respecting it. Of course. They're like, you don't have, you know, like my dad was in the, you know, I'm not saying me, but like people, you know, in Texas or in Kansas, like, you know, I got I got my brother over there. My dad was a Marine. He was in Vietnam. How, you know, fuck you for not respecting, you know, the military, you know, and this person saying, well, your dad, is stupid for fighting in Vietnam, you know? So you lose the common language, right? And, and and they don't respect each other. And that is the biggest problem I feel today, which also has been a problem with, with PTS, right? Because we basically have a self-imposed draft. So the military, because politically it is almost, I mean, there, for a congressman to come up and say we want to, because everybody has like basically, you know, nightmares of Vietnam, right? And so Vietnam really shaped this country for worse or for better for wh- how we are now, how we talk about the military. But, you know, the moment you say draft, everybody who is against anything militarily... They think war. They think war. Yeah. And, and they think, you know, oh, it's Vietnam again. You know, we're going to self-impose Vietnam. But what happens is in in parts of Texas where, like, people who are in, engaged into the military, they, like, they have a, a deep, deep, deep connection to the military. So because the 1% is only serving, the military is basically self-imposed a draft. So these guys are doing four, five, six tours because there's not enough fucking boots on the ground. There's not enough. So they're saying, you're going to go again. You're going to go again. You're going to go again. So we're self-imposing the draft on the guys who are already committed. Yeah. And so people forget that, like the National Reserve, the National Reserve was never designed to see military combat. The National Reserve is really designed to uh, fight, uh, to police uh, riots. Yeah, a lot of uh, guys, the reserve was sent over there. Yeah. yeah, the reserve saw some of the worst combat and they weren't trained for combat. They're really a reservist. I mean, that's what the word meant. It was a reserve military branch that was designed to take care of non combatant stuff in, in, right. in the country. So, yeah, so like if stuff were to go down, like ship. how the hurricanes or any of these issues, exactly. like they could be sent down exactly. as a means of exactly. uh, policing or dealing with They them. weren't designed to go fight in, you know, Fallujah. Right. And that's what's happened. And but because we don't have enough people in the military. Right. It's only less than one percent. We're self-imposing a draft on these guys and these and and these girls. And it causes a lot of problems. But to me, going back to your original question, the one thing that I've gotten from from doing it in Texas and Virginia and Kansas, all these different states, is that we don't have a common language anymore. Like if somehow we were able to develop a draft of some kind where where people who so your your parents were muslim right mm-hmm. so it's really 
unless you serve something with a Muslim, like unless, which is why guys who 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 are trying to defend Muslim who the Muslims who basically risked their asses off in Iraq and Afghanistan as translators and as you know as coordinators, and now that like they're getting deported, which is driving people in the military nuts, right? Like this, these guys, they were our lifeblood. You know, it's unbelievable, right? Right, but. I'm, when you serve with someone in some capacity, race, Your brother. race, religion gets erased, right? I don't see you, I don't, because what happens is the media paints you, paints a certain segment as something, as a Jew, as a Christian, as a Muslim. It's easy to, it's, it's easier to compartmentalize and present that. Correct. To someone and say, you're in this box, this person's in this box, and but when follow we, color but, within the lines. But if we serve together in some way, which is what sports does, right? Sports does that. Sports, in a way, erases all demographics in many ways because what what matters in sports is what can you do between the lines, right? And we don't care if you know if if, if you worship a goat, you know, can you catch the ball or can you hit the baseball, or whatever it is, right? So by by your different demographics, if we were to serve together in some ways, then we would be able to understand each other. We would be able to communicate, and I think that's what's happened in the country that no one is. Wi- we're so there's no through line there's no through line anymore like it's now it's <clears> like <throat> i'm for this i'm for this i'm for this i'm for this and 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 the media has magnified it right because the magnify it, it's not it sells it sells and they need eyeballs right so they're they're not going they're only going to put stuff on that is uh that's going to get advertising dollars right so it gets broken down even to a worse it's level the, it's the illusion that everyone needs to have it figured out too. right because exactly. like oh i'm in this political party this is my belief this is this and then someone's like i'm, I'm figuring it out oh well you're in- enabling this thing it's like exactly. no man i'm you know we're all trying to figure it out no, together we're, we're all trying to figure it out together and to me what i've gotten from doing the country is like i feel like it's been the and I've talked about it before and in fact I've been thinking about doing a TED talk on it because I'm like but but my wife goes you know the moment you say that man you got to really phrase that correctly because when you say a draft people are going to go nuts on you hey they're going to go it's the uh, it's the same thing you were saying before the idea itself people could care less and they'll massacre it but if it's presented in such a way that's like, here, here's the tangible version of this idea right. that was thought out. And because it happened, you know, Israel has one and Israel is very successful with it. And, and that, and this is why Israel, I mean, people are very committed. I'm going to, I'm going to knock that thing over before I leave here. <laughs> I'm going to knock that thing over. Uh, thanks. Uh, but Israel is really, um, I mean, they're, 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 they're taught, for me, how they use the draft. They're a, um, an example. Uh, or what we could do and I think at some point see in World War One, whether you were Jewish or whatever you were going to fight now we had Dodgers in World War One, and we had Dodgers in the Second World War as well not as much as in Vietnam and Korea but we had them you were going to go fight that immediately bonded you once you came back Right, I mean, you you brought you developed a brotherhood. So, if you were Irish Italian, or I mean, if you're Irish Italian, if you're Italian or Irish, and you fought with a with a Jew, you had a different perception now of what that person was because you fought with them, right? You served with them. You're you're probably more willing to defend him politically because you've served with him. But now, you know, we have so many discombobulated demographics in the country now which we didn't have in the first world war or in the second world war you know you were either i mean really you were just either christian or 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 or, or jewish basically you know i mean yeah. you're, you're it was pretty it was pretty simple now i get it i mean people are going to bring up civil rights and, and 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 we did some horrific things and i also i also, i play a black guy in my play as well because I, I i try to make that point as well i mean i play a friend, a friend does a good one too <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> Do you really? <clears throat> no, not really. Oh, it's, yes. it's, it's super characterish and silly, but we we save it for three PLT because oh. now I, I'm not gonna op- like I said I'm not gonna open the door because I want to allow the, the yeah. conversation. I just want to see if you guys. I'm so glad a friend. Up. I'm so flat. A friend came in here. He's really like the buoy to this freaking ship. Yeah, thank you. Well, I just wanted to see if you guys had a yeah, defense bro, for that. So you playing a black dude and thing? <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? So you go to war and shit. <laughs> yeah, man, that this shit is bad. Man, war is fucked up, son. You know what I mean? And yeah, you know, we going to war every day, motherfucker. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> out in these streets. 
And, you know, I, I, I always talk, you, you, you have to point out what, I mean, what happened in the Second World War, with, I mean, you had African Americans, mm-hmm. even in the First World War, who went off to fight, came back, and were lynched. So, I mean, so yeah, there, fuck, man. there are some horrible, and, and, you know, the, huh. the, there are some horrible stories in, in, in that. Well, maybe they, like, did something crazy, like talk to a white girl or something. Yeah, well, I mean, it's I just deserved it. They're you know? not very proudful things of the country. Like you know, when you start it, you know, and then you know, you hear Listen, about when the white when the no, white women saying. smoke weed, and then the black men with their gigantic penises take over. It's I mean, know, we gotta <laughs> kill someone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you study you study the Harlem Hellfighters, and I mean, they were a bunch of badass guys in the First World War that um, were just they were badass. They were badass. They right? were badass, and they came back, and they were you know treated like dog shit. You know, and so, so I try to make that point as well. So the irony is they're treated like dog shit by the people who didn't have that connection with them. Correct. You hit. There you go. You took the words right out of my mouth. That's the. That was what I was trying to get to. I was going to say too that that that, that, that they they, too. they didn't have that connection. It's amazing, dude. You're, you yeah, I was just. I didn't want to interrupt him, but I was like, same exact thing of I what can. he just said. Remember yeah. what you just said? I was thinking exactly mm-hmm. that too. No, I know. I was. I was seeing you. Thanks, bro. It. I. I'm, uh, it's groundbreaking what I do. Really. So anyhow, I, I just think that. <laughs> so when I do the play. <laughs> He's defending against <laughs> no, it. No, no. He's I'm defending just, against I'm, it. I'm actually getting better with not opening the doors. Good for you. <laughs> That's because I'm laying off you a little bit. Uh, Patrick Lillis. Patrick Lillis, yeah. Patrick. 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 I say it. Patrick. I say it. I'm very uh, good with that. Well, I found out in rehearsal library of Congress, he, I, I called him Pat one time and he got really upset with me. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll get it. You know, I'll call you Patrick. What did he say? He got really upset? Oh, he just said, you know, I, I, I prefer people didn't call me um, Pat. <laughs> That's Patrick getting really upset, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and my sister, I have a sister, I have four sisters and one of my sister's name is Pat. So uh, I, so Pat came really naturally to me. And so then one day in rehearsal, I heard our sound guy, who, they've known each other longer than I've known him. He said, hey, Pat. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He just called you Pat. He goes, well, I've known him. I go, well, yeah, but I've paid you more. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've paid you more, fucker. Time is money. And time is money. And but so, having him on board really helped you hash this thing out, right? Yeah, so I finally got Patrick, and he was finally able, you know, it was a combination of people, but, I mean, Matt Hoverman, I have to give him credit, because he, you know, he was the guy also said, you know, he gave me... My he, name is Ho. Yeah, he, he has his Sorry. solo show workshop, and it's gotten really popular Sorry. now. I mean, in fact, he did it here in New York, and then it's gotten so popular that he... He got a job. He he writes for Disney now. What's the, what was his solo solo show? He has a workshop. He a teaches workshop. You. He's he was phenomenal. Oh, he has a solo workshop. Workshop, yeah. He, and he basically he knows. His, his, I mean, there's, we can do a whole podcast talking about how great his workshop is, but he just really he makes you perform what you're going to write. And every day you had a deadline. Really, the whole thing about his workshop was you had a deadline. Like you had a next week you had to bring in something and you were going to act it out. So you couldn't say, oh, I couldn't figure it out. No, you, you, if you couldn't figure it out, you were going to tell the, the class that you were with. It was usually a small class, six to seven people that you didn't figure it out. So And everybody did figure it out because no one wanted to be that one person. So he imposed some, some guidelines and that helped you. It's, it, was, it, was, it was everything. Incredible. It was, it was, it's everything. You know, and, and, and anything. You, if you don't have a deadline, then you'll, you'll never get it done. So if you knew that at the end of the workshop, you were going to perform 20 minutes of what you're trying to create, you took it a little bit more seriously, and you know you you paid up front. So at, at what that point makes you accountable for the work you're putting in? Correct. Yeah. So at what point? How long is the show? Uh, fifty six minutes. Fifty six minutes. At what point did you say we got it? <laughs> well, it's, there, it's not even there yet. I mean, oh, oh no, you're still refining. Well, it got to a point where so the way it happened is I so I did the workshop, and then Patrick said he you know I brought Patrick on, and then we we created a version of it. And I, I audition. I did it for like six people in a space, and they were like, "It was still not good." They were like, "It was better now." It had grown, and it was like, "Wow, I think you're on to something." Was it a lot of the same people? Those six people, or was no, it always different people? Completely different people. Actually, <clears throat> professional people. Now we had, right, right. We had some board members from like Playwrights Horizon, and we had some people there, and they were like, um, "Well, I mean, I think you're on to something." I just think it's a little bit long. And at that time, I had Shakespeare in it. You know, sh- you know, PTSD is really talked about, and you know, Shakespeare talked about it. And Henry V, Part Two, um, yeah. Henry the Fourth, Part Two. Kate talks about it with Hotspur. Yeah, she I remember said, that. She says, "Why don't you, you know, why, why, you know?" You can laugh, my friend. <laughs> you don't sleep anymore. You don't talk anymore. You know, he, she's telling him, you, you, you're, not, "You're not the same man anymore." You know, in the second part, and basically, Hotspur has been fighting Prince Hal, and he's been developing, you know, post traumatic stress. And Shake, that's how amazing fucking Shakespeare is, because he. <clears throat> like, I interpreted it that that Kate was a cunt. 
<laughs> yeah, that's how I. But it's a different it's interpretation. But I mean, of human behavior. Yeah, she was the first cunt. And then, cunt but and, and and then you know, and it, it, it's talked about in the <laughs> in, in the Odyssey. You know, the Odyssey talks about it. You know, and oh, really? They in the Odyssey? Yeah. So I mean, it's 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 been documented by that's really old time. You know, I mean, the whole play about Homer. I mean, the whole Iliad about on Homer is based. Talks. He talks. It's about the the sacrifice of warriors, and and it's very poetic. And there's actually a documentary called. Um, Oh fuck! I forget what it's called, but the guy, it was basically a doctor did a whole thing about what the the stress the guys from Vietnam were going through and comparing it to the Iliad and uh, and, oh, and wow. the Odyssey. But so, so all of that came into play. Look at how the whole thing just opened up. It's well, like, so it, but so I had Shakespeare and I wanted you know I had very different ideas of it, and then so I took it back into I took another workshop with Matt Hoverman, and he was like, yeah, you know, you need these, and so I started finding more letters, and so then he basically gave me the deadline finally, and the second time I took it with him, he's like. Look, you need to f- pick some letters that you like that move you. Something really simple like direction like that, but until someone tells it to you. Pick some letters he said, that he said, move you. Yeah, he said, pick the letters that you like the best. Like, don't worry about, don't worry about picking the right letter. Pick the, pick the letters that you like the best. And, 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 and I was, because I was, I was getting stuck. Because it'll bleed through. Yeah, and I was getting stuck in trying to tell, I wanted to tell everyone's story. You know, you, you can't in 55 minutes. Fucking impossible. So he said, just pick the letters that you like the mess, the best. And that was kind of, that was the linchpin for me, the epiphany that I was like, ah. Oh. And then it, it, then it freed me up creatively tremendously because then I was looking for what I wanted, not trying to please what someone else wanted. And that was huge. And then I found all the letters. I got with Patrick again and we formed it. And then he said, let's, let's, I, I paid him and said, I, I want to form these letters into a solo show you know, a better one that we did, you know, and he said, okay. And so we, um, I did it on a rainy night. We did, we had like 25 minutes. There's a f- solo show festival called, a, it's called a one-on-one festival and it's at, at the Bowery Poetry Club. And I did it on a rainy memorial weekend about three years ago. It was rainy. There was, I'm not lying to you, maybe six people in the audience. Mm. I had rehearsed it for like four <laughs> weeks and I was like, and I remember thinking, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And so I did it. And I was like, it's going to be horrible. And everyone was like, they were moved by it. They were like, that is the most. Cool am- as hell. They were like, that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You have to keep telling that story. That was all I needed. And then I said, let's make it longer. So then I, um, I added the more letters. And then my, my wife said, you need to produce this. You need to finally do this and get it out of your head and get it done with because you'll never be satisfied until you do it fully. Fully do it. Yeah. Fully do it. So I, I said, Patrick, I want to do this to the I want to take it to the Edinburgh Festival Fringe in, in Scotland. So he said, All right. So I said, I want to turn into a basically a fifty minute play. And so we worked on it and we crafted it. We rehearsed for six weeks. The whole goal going to having a having a play. And when you go to the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, you're invited to do it at fifty nine East fifty nine theater which is an off-Broadway beautiful house and they do a festival called, um, uh, it's called uh, uh, Edinburgh Comes to New York or something like that. It's basically all the shows that are going to the Festival Fringe, East of Edinburgh, I think it's called, East Edinburgh. Um, all the shows that are going to the Festival Fringe in Scotland are invited to do a preview of them in New York if you're, if you're from New York. I mean, you, they don't invite you, you. They invite you, but then you pay. Yeah, my, exp- my only exposure to that or understanding of that is... Um, uh, professor director that i've worked with who teaches at the pit peter michael marino yeah he was at that festival and yeah. it's, it's it's a big deal oh that you were that you were there man it That's was amazing there's three thousand shows there and so <clears throat> i got very and you need luck and everything but when i did the um so we rehearsed and we got it to the ready to go to the festival i, I did it for two nights at 59 east 59 theater and i got really fucking lucky i got a review from the huffington post all right <laughs> Girl called me up. She goes, you know, I know you're doing this. I saw you because you know they they put you on the the calendar of you know what's going on. And I picked a good name. You know, I couldn't figure out what, the, what I was going to call. It was at one time the play was called The Brothers and Brotherhood and Banner Brother. Oh, I can't do that. That's a Private Ryan. That's bad. Mm. Oh shit! There's a, there's actually a TV show called Banner Brother. I can't do that. So and then she goes, just call it what it is. It's the American Soldier. You know? Who said that? The writer? My wife. <clears throat> Your wife. Okay. She was like, just call it what it is. It's about it's the American Soldier. Just. Don't try to, like, I was trying to, because I was like, I didn't want to. It's a great name. I, did, I didn't want to, I didn't want it to be like, uh, you know, the American Texan soldiers. That wasn't my idea. I was like, it sounds so American, but that's not my, that's not the goal of the show. 
it was really wasn't but it, it just it's always worked out it's not it's it's perfect and so when i did it she reviewed it and she's like she fucking loved it she gave me a glorious review and that when we were going to the festival fringe was huge because i had that piece of press to sell to the Huff theaters, post. the Huffington yeah. post and they were like she called it flawless powerful she wow, was like man. it was the most amazing and so congratulations when I, that's amazing yeah thing. no and i i only tell it because i tell the story because it was luck she was there and she gave us she basically gave wind under her wings so when we got to scotland and did, and did the play because people so it's hard because there's three thousand shows there so when you're over there you really need as much press as you can get so to by, be able to stand out and be seen and, and sell yeah. it right and so by having a little bit of press i was able to drum up some audience i mean like when you go to scotland it is not atypical for you to do the show for three people like, I was going to say, what are the audiences like there? They're you know? not bad. I was always fortunate. I was always like half full, which was like a, a feat in itself. Yeah, because considering how many shows are there in the first place, people are picking and choosing the ones that they're going to see. Everyone. So. And what I started to find out is that the play was really talking to a deeper audience. It was talking because a lot of UK veterans and family members of veterans were dealing with post-traumatic stress. And they and culturally over there, they probably don't even speak about those things. You hit it on the head. They don't talk. Yeah. That's where the whole thing stiff upper lip comes from. You don't talk about what's going wrong. You, you, you ignore so, it. I wanted to ask because I know we might be wrapping up fairly soon. But what's one, one or two things that when people see the American soldier that you want them or you hope that they would have as a takeaway? Oh, from it's the show? simple. I, I say all the time. The biggest takeaway from the play is I want everyone to have a a truer and deeper appreciation and admiration for veterans and their family members go through. And I say it in every press release, it's not a play about war or against war. It's just to give people a truer understanding of what that commitment really is all about. Um, so when you hear someone who's a veteran who's experienced combat or who's lost a family member, those are the people that are basically on the front lines of what this country stands for. And uh, we should recognize that no matter how cliche and, 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 um, what's you know jaded we could be as a society you just have to recognize that those people on the front lines are the ones that are they allow us to bitch about what we want to bitch about in this country so and that's really the thing and that's what everybody come i just did it in dc for the library of congress i did both a, a current play that i'm doing in, in that play and the lady said i saw your play twice i saw it at the kennedy center and i saw it here and i just wanted to say and it was a really touching moment that happens all the time she said you know, I, did, I didn't get a chance to talk to you at the Kennedy Center because everybody was coming up to you and you were really busy. And I said, oh, well, I really appreciate you coming. You know, she goes, I just want to let you know. So I do, a le I, do the, I do a Dear Bill letter where she talks about saying goodbye to her son. And she talks about finally learning uh, how he died in, in the war. And it's a very powerful moment. And the kid dies in a, in a helicopter crash, in a Huey crash. So she came up to me and told me, you know, I just want to let you know that my husband died in a helicopter in Vietnam. And every time I see your play, I'm reminded of my husband. Oh, wow. And I was just like, <clears throat> so you, those are the moments you get, right? And she goes, thank you for what you're doing. I think, I hope you never stop because it's, an, it's a message that needs to be told. And visually, if you can picture this lady, I would say she was probably either from Hispanic or Middle Eastern background. And that is the American soldier, right? It's not what you think it is. It's really a hodgepodge of what's made this country of immigrants that have from all different races and backgrounds that have built and f and fought for the country, so she was really so she yeah, was atypical of the kind of person that comes and up. Still to continues me. to this day. It's it's immigrants. Yeah, it's just a different immigration now. I mean, now it's a different it's a different sect of people. You know, now we have Muslims and Mexican Americans who are fighting for us. All right. Do you uh so, so you're in it, so you you have success there, right? The house is half full in Edinburgh. Yeah, so right? it gets half full and and then we get nominated. We started getting reviews, and they started getting bigger. Was this, was Patrick come with you over there? No, what? I didn't take him. I couldn't afford the fucker. <laughs> I couldn't afford him. I, I'm sure he wanted to come. But I was like, Dude, I can't. You, you come for free, um, <laughs> right? Uh, but I mean, I, when you're there, you're there on your own. You have it locked in. I was all by myself. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I brought I brought her an assistant because I needed some help. But that was about it. But that was about it. Um, 
But then we got Do they nominated. pay you for that? No, it's just a festival, right? You get half the house. Yeah. Every theater has different splits. I mine was a sixty. If it's not split. about the money at that point in time, no, no. Just, but right, I made money. Actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't make money. It definitely, money. it helps. I'm, sh- I'm yeah, sure, sure it helps. With like yeah, three thousand right. others, you know? yeah, right. yeah. But I mean, if you break even, you made money. I All made, right. I made like a, I made a couple thousand, and mm-hmm. I was like, oh wow. And really, it was one week of sold out houses because, on the. Second week, I think it was, we got I got nominated. So out of three thousand shows, three thousand fucking a, shows, a hundred shows, huge festival, man. It's, it's a huge, huge festival. A hundred shows were nominated for the Amnesty International Award. So they picked a hundred shows that they highly recommended. They should be nominated. That were nominated, and then and out of those hundred uh, hundred shows, they pick I think ten that are given an award. But if you get nominated, it's a huge deal because it gets a lots of press. Yeah, yeah. So. I didn't right. even know I got nominated until Patrick he sent me a Facebook message because you just got nominated for an Amnesty <laughs> International Award. And I was like, what? What does that mean? Because you should check it out. And I got on the website and I was like, holy shit. And there it was. Americans, it's on my website. You know, when you go to the link, it says Amnesty International. You click the link and see this list and you see the, it's alphabetical. And you go to T, the American soldier. And it's to this day, it's one of the happiest days visually when I see that limit. That, Man, that that was it, man. And that that kind of started the the run of the show because then the show sold out, started getting really good reviews, and then as I came back from Scotland, Patrick was like, "Well, now you're in a pickle now, because now you've had success." So if the show bombed, or was just kind of a dud in Scotland, then you're like, "You did it. You produced it. It it's done. You're like you accomplished the task." But now you're in this. Now you're like, now you're you've had success. So now what are you gonna do with it? And I go, I have no idea. And because I'm big a social media guy, where it does, this is where social media is a very powerful leverage. Um, an old acting friend of mine from Houston, Texas, had been we were friends on Facebook, and I was always tweeting and on Facebooking and stuff. And he was like, "Dude, you know, I would like to bring your play to my theater," and that was the first tour stop in Houston. He's like, "I want you to bring it back to Houston." I go, "Really?" He goes, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think you'd be great for this theater that I, I'm I'm the head of their marketing, but." I think your theater would be your show would be really well. So, long story short, I came back that summer. That next April, they flew me down. I did the show, and since then, I've probably done the show since Houston. I've done the show in I don't know twenty cities. Wow, man! It, it's been That's twenty amazing. cities. And then someone in, I did it in Hoboken, New Jersey, and they knew somebody at the Kennedy Center. There was an audience member, and she says, "Your play would be really well at the Millennium Stage at the Kennedy Center." And you hear the word Kennedy Center, you're like, <laughs> yeah. "Where? Where?" <laughs> I don't think so. She goes, "No, you should reach out to them." You know, and um, so I did. I reached out to them. I say I was told that you might be interested in my project. You know, and she goes, "Well, I called. I, I emailed, and she goes, I never get a response." So then I called. She goes, well, just send me your stuff. Um, send me your stuff and I'll get back to you. And I said, okay. So I did. I was like, that's going down the rabbit hole. That's not, not going to happen. It was the Kennedy Center. And sure enough, like a month later, I sent an email and she responded back. Yeah, you know what? We I meant to get back to you and I forgot, um, which is another lesson in follow through. Yeah, follow through follow, for sure. You don't know. And she said, you know, we're, I, think, I think your project would do well here. Uh, how does January work? And I was like, let me check my calendar. <laughs> I was like, uh, and, and I was like, January what? She goes, how about January 22nd? And I was like, that's my birthday. She goes, oh, well, I think it would be great, you know. And at that time, I, f- I said yes. And I was, you know, I was obviously on cloud nine. I was calling everybody. I was Facebook. And I was like, I'm going to the fucking Kennedy Center. It's unbelievable. But I that's told Patrick great. and Patrick was like, you got to be kidding me. From where this fucking place started and you're going to the Kennedy Center? From being in a place where you were With just pizza. thinking about wanting to throw the whole thing out. I, there was a time where I literally was so frustrated with it, a friend, that I grabbed all the letters and I threw them in the trash can. And my wife goes, and she, my wife, to her credit, she pulled them out of the trash can. She goes, I'm not going to let you do that because I know oh, you'll, wow. be, you'll be very upset if you do that. And it, it was a, it's a, it, there's many lessons in this play and the follow through was a, another big lesson. And so we went to the Kennedy Center and it was doing inauguration weekend. And, you know, after the Kennedy Center, you know, the military time and, and it happens with everything. You've just got to keep a steady hand. I've learned so much from the project, but by going to the Kennedy Center, it got DC Press. And so just like the Huffington Post was a big lucky break for it to go to, to Scotland, getting DC Press was also a big break because the Military Times picked us up. 
So once the so the Military Times is like the New York Times for all veterans. Everyone who is deep in the military gets the Military Times. There's actually an Army Times, there's a Navy Times, there's an Air Force Times, there's a Coast Guard Times. There's a, but in the Military Times, whatever major story the Military Times post goes to all those times. What's well, huge, right? So hmm. they said that is that's amazing. Man. So they said we want to do an interview with you. We want to know what, what more about this play, and that set it up to another kick. Sure did. And so then the Military Times sees it. And so that gets on national press and then other cities book me. Um, and then hmm. I did it in, and then when it, what, what's also happened is when I would do it at a city, someone who was in the audience would say, you have to go reach out to this other person in this city. And the show has just been pinging like that. And then the Library of Congress came out because she goes, you know, we found your press release and we we're wondering if you would be willing to bring your show to the Library of Congress. And I was like, Again, same thing. Blah, 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 Gee, blah, let blah, me blah, think. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> let me check my schedule. <laughs> and then that project opened up, right? And that project really exploded because then she said, you know, she, she, they wanted me because this year is the centennial of the f when we enter the First World War and 2018 will be the centennial when the First World War ended. In case no one even knows, I just learned that creating the play, November 11th, which is Veterans Day, the reason why it's Veterans Day is because that's when the armistice of the First World War was signed. Mm. And I didn't know that until I was working on the project. She goes, well, we have these, she explained to me the centennial, she goes, you know, would you be interested in adding some uh, World War I letters to your play? And I said, well, I can't really do that. The play's kind of set, you know. And so she said, you know, would you create a play for us? And so long story short, they, they paid me and commissioned me to create this other play, which I was telling uh, TJ about. Um, but that's crazy. So, right? it, so it gets more press. So it's right? another. It's another play. So it's another play in base. But so I did both plays back to back, and so now the play for next year it's been booked. I'm going to the Citadel uh, in April, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to do it five nights in Rawway, New Jersey, and Union Performing Arts Center, and then it's gonna and then there's like three theaters now. So now this whole now the play has developed and like it's got it's got it's got uh, SEO you know like. Um, Social, uh, what's fucking SEO? S S S C E. What does S E O S E O stands for? Expert optimization. Social search engine optimization. Search engine. Bro, Fuck. I knew it was optimization. Search engine optimization because now every time you Google veteran, the American soldier comes up, so it gets picked up all the so time. So the, the piece that you created for Library of Congress is that then would that be considered a companion piece to your play? It's it's being done that way right now. I, it's very, they're two very different projects. Uh, the difference between the American soldier and the World War One play is that the World War One play is really based on one guy. But what's fascinating about all of them, even the World War One guy, and so I, and I, I just did an interview for a Honeysuckle magazine, and I said, I thought I was creating a play about a soldier in World War One, but I was creating a play about a first generation immigrant who was a Jew immigrant, and and then I started studying all the anti semitism that was going on in the country in the doing the late 1800s and early 1900s. So when the First World War came, these guys ponied up because they wanted to prove to everybody how American he, they were. Yeah. Which is mm -hmm. as true today as anything else, right? From wherever you are so in the in country. So in a funny way, almost like a prequel to this idea of the American soldier. Correct. Yeah. And, oh. yeah. and so I did it back to back and I think we're, I'm in discussions with the Union Performing Arts Center. They want me to do it kind of back to back. We haven't figured out how we want to do it because it's kind of taxing for me. But, um, but yeah, so... But you're also part of the, so, is it the, uh, the farm theater has, it, has it? Yeah. So he invited me to do, you know, uh, basically Patrick said, you know, would you be interested in doing for this festival? And I said, um, go I said, fuck yes, yourself. I, I wish I would have <laughs> said, go fuck yourself. Cause I'm so beat from the library of Congress. <laughs> I just did that. Like we had tech the other day and he was like, you know, can you beat it? I didn't even want to come to tech. I was like, I don't want to do tech. What's tech when you go up there, like rehearsal, yeah, just, just like a pre-rehearsal, like yeah, tech, yeah, rehearsal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. tech rehearsal. It's, so, it's taxing on you to do it, isn't it? It is. It's exhausting. And I wish I would have said no because I really needed some time off after Do you the get nervous years. before you go up to do it? Is there any nerves? No. I mean, I don't get nerves like, oh, I'm going to... No, I, the only nerves I get is I get anxious of, that I'm going to be able to hit the emotional moments. You know, that's yeah. the only thing I get. I mean, You have like, to lock yourself into it. Well, yeah. You've, you, put, you've put in so many reps at this time doing, having done the show. Yeah. And, but sometimes you go dry, man. Sometimes. Yeah, Cause yeah. Some, well, the brain has a mechanism. So I go into like, I do weird, I, my, my acting is very, it's a hodgepodge of different theories and trainings. But when I had to go emotional, I go sense memory. Right. And, and there's, there's some time when you do sense memory over and over and over and over. It's hard again, to pull from the same source. Right. Well, your brain, eventually your brain goes, 
like that. That's not happening anymore. It's like it's just like a callus. Yeah, yeah like it's almost br- like a callus. Your brain, forms. yeah, your brain is trying. To, yeah, your brain is trying to tell you, no, no, no. Like it, it stops believing it because you, you you can literally trick the mind to believe that it, it's going through or that you're experiencing it. But if you do it so many times in a row, in a row, in a row, your your brain starts saying, no, 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 you don't need to go there anymore, right? Yeah, and it starts like the natural survival mechanism of the brain starts telling you, stop crying. You don't need to cry anymore. Like you know whatever you're thinking about, like it's not real. Like, I'm not going to let you believe it because I'm exhausted from it because you get adrenal fatigue. The body goes through adrenal fatigue. And so the body starts doing everything it can to stop you from feeling those emotions. So you you do everything you can to stay as calm and as relaxed as you can. So the body has the energy. So you have the energy to trick your brain that you can still go there. But there are moments when it's hard, man. That, and you're like, you're, you're like, oh, fuck, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. And then, then all of a sudden, because you're struggling throughout the whole play, then it poof, explodes, at the explodes. Very, at the very end. You know, and you're like, no, there, I was going to say, is, are there ever any times where you're so locked in that it's, oh, yeah. you're so deep into it, you just like feel like you're not going to pull out of the moment? Or, or, or that you're just like feeling it in such a fucking deep way? What's I would happened, imagine that. What's happened now is that I, I get really emotional really fast. Oh, okay. So, like, so you, it's almost like you feel it coming on. Yeah. So like, I, so, so <laughs> you know it's coming, and that in it, in and of itself. I was watching Sea Biscuit with my son, and I was crying. And my son was like, he's eight, and he's like, "Why are you crying, Dad? What's up with you? What's up with you?" <laughs> and, but but you, you you stay in this very raw state that is sometimes I don't know if it's that's uh, interesting. It's you not, stay in a raw state. It's not productive, you know, and it's not very good for you. And you're not designed to be in that state, you know, but. It, you're trying to do it, you know, which becomes the challenge of the show, right? Because the challenge of the show is people like some guy came up to me when I did it in Red Hook. He goes, "How do you fucking remember all those lines?" I go, "Dude, if that was the fucking goal, man, <laughs> like I wish if that I, was the only element. Easy, yeah. I wish that was the element that I had to complete, you know, remembering my lines. Like that's the least of <laughs> like that is the least of my worries right now, you know. But people think that you know because people f- forget that learning lines is physical." You don't remember, you know, 7,000 words, which is what's in my play. And I only know that because I had to create the other play. So I was using, I used word counts. As a template. As a template. <laughs> um, because of time. And right. you don't, you're not thinking, oh, I got to remember 7,000 words. No, you, you, you're you just like, you know, you remember things in your childhood that, that are very emotional to you. And you'll always be, you'll be 90 years old and you'll be able to tell that story like it's yesterday, Right. And yeah. that's the way you were, and that's the way. Is that the same thing? That's how you memorize plays. Is it, is it, so it's not only repetition, it's also the emotion that goes along with that. Yeah. So when I learn plays and I try to teach this to people, but like people, some guy came up to me because you must have a, because I did both plays. I did, basically I did two hours of two solo shows and he was like, how the fuck do you do that? And I said, well, it's, it's, it is, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend it for anybody, but I, it, you, 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 you I would learn, I learned to play through memory, through images. So when I, on the first play, I mean on the second play, the World War I play, I would literally, so uh, give you an example. Uh, in 1917, milk was 36 cents, a loaf of bread was 9 cents, and the average yearly income of a man was $650. So I, okay, I got to memorize that line. How do I do it? Okay, 19, so I see, in uh, 1917, that's easy to memorize. I see milk with a big 9 cents in it. See, I'm um, 36 cents on it. I see a loaf of bread with nine cents on it, and I see someone giving me 650 dollars. So I start picturing, I start creating. It's the like mo- a memory game that you. Yeah, play. you start playing a memory game. So your body, your is mind, that something you did inherently, or somebody you learned that re- through your acting? I read it. Th- I learned it through my acting. I learned it through a guy who's. I. My mom used to always say, "You." My mom was, just like immigrants, they come from a fear base. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. So they, they, and, and they, we know all about that. Yeah. And they tell you to not do things because they're afraid that you're going to fail and they don't do it out of harm, but with their, they, they speak negatively. So my mom said, you can never be an actor because you have to memorize so many lines. And she did it because she said it not because she was mean. She said, cause she doesn't want to see her son fail and she never wants to see her son be broke. And she never wants to see her son try to become an actor and it's too hard and something that she can never do. And, she, and so all these weird Good for you, man, that's, all, that's cool that you recognize that. So I said, no, I'm going to be a fucking actor and I'm going to have the world's strongest memory. So I was always researching. So I came across a book, a guy called memorize a minute. His name is Harry Lorraine. He's notoriously known for having a, f- for teaching people memory and, he read a whole book and he had this whole technique. You basically, uh, to this day, I kind of still remember them. It's one through 20. One was um, 
And, and that's how you remember. One is Ty. Two is uh, Noah. Three is mom. Um, four is rye bread. Five is the law. Six. So he would give you images of one through 20 and you would use those images to, for anything. So if you saw the word 44 and so you would think, okay, for, so you, you, if you get a number, you think, okay, two law gavels hitting each other. Okay. I can remember two law gavels hitting together and you go on, so on. And you would use, me, it's called memory association. And so you do that in acting. And I try to teach people that in acting. I said, you know, what you need to start doing, don't try to memorize a line. You're going to drive yourself nuts trying to memorize a line word by word. What you need to do is create a movie, right? So, so I would literally see someone in 1917. Um, I just had a commercial audition for Ameritrade. In fact, I keep checking my phone because I'm on hold for it. It's a national commercial. Fingers crossed, man. Yeah, me too. And uh, I was really off book. And the way I did it is I got the lines. And so I still remember the line. It was just yesterday I auditioned. Um, so, you know, my, my broker told me that, you know, that my, that my portfolio manager, my my financial advisor told me that my my portfolio was up uh, 7%, but the market is only up 12, the market is up really 12%. But on top of that, I had to pay his fee, so I'm really only up 6%. So that's the line that I had to memorize, right? And I did it really quick off the line. But I don't memorize all those words. Your brain can figure that out. What I memorize is 12, 7, 12, and 6. So I think of, okay, why am I saying 7%? 7% is because that's what my broker told me. I can memorize that, right? So my broker told me I was up 7%. 12% is what the market is up. Okay, I can, so 7 is before 12. So I think, okay, oh, my broker told me I was up 7%, 7% but the market is up 12%. Then they, the rest is easy, right? Yeah, because you're not just blabbing memorized words. You're, you're associating you're, it with something, something that actually is. Right, so you're right. connecting it. So your memory latches onto it. So then I think, on top of that, I had to pay my fees. And I know what's next is this number six, 6%. 6 And so that's how you memorize. So I would go through the whole solo show, literally m putting images. And some images are harder. Some images are easier. And, and good writing. My, when my writing was really good, the images were fast. When the writing was really bad, it was hard to make it. Hard. So, it was hard. Oh, so that's a good indicator that the the writing is bad. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's funny. It is. And it's that, funny. That's it didn't why, flow right. That's why Shakespeare is the easiest stuff to memorize. Because when you look at Shakespeare's writing, it's all in images. He un, he. This is how great this guy was. I mean, this is. I mean, the world. He's the world's greatest writer. He in, intuitively, instinctively, geniusly, he understood that because he did it from a point of need. He had a crank out a play so fast he had to help his actors and a lot of time his actors did not rehearse the plays they literally got the script the day before they were performing because he would say because you would have companies and reps he would say okay and, and that and which is why men did the girl parts right and they would vice versa so they would do three plays you know in a weekend because it was all about money so he would say how can i write this stuff to make it easy for these guys to learn this stuff I need to write in images, you know, you know, and so he, and the rhythmic nature of iambic pentameter and exact, all, that. So all that. There's just so much craziness. It's so much crazy. There. And so it's my you favorite like, pentameter, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> if I had it's my pick favorite one. band, actually. <laughs> pentameter. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you do those tricks, memory tricks too? I yes, there are there are a number of them that I try because for me that's always been a. a my most effective work came from obviously when you understand what yeah. you're saying and you associate yeah. it with something but instead you know, of blathering on. But you know words. why it is, is because at the end of the day, the goal of all acting is, matter, is to be relaxed and calm. Keep a straight face too. <laughs> That's <laughs> my advice. Yeah. And, and don't fart. Just write that down too as well, fellas. Yeah. Because yeah, you put, you put the work in to the point <laughs> where fart. you yeah. want to be able to take the script and just go like this. Okay. Yeah. I can allow this I'm to the guy. be my subconscious yeah. Yeah. functioning. You want, you know? no, you want to be able to, you want to be able, and it's, and it's very true in film and TV, right? I mean, the camera, will, if you're nervous, the camera knows. Oh yeah. And the camera's like, no, no, you're nervous. I don't like you. And so, yeah. and so the goal of memory. So if you can get the memory out of the way, no, that's not true for everyone. I mean, that, I mean, it, it, it's all what works for you, you know. But um, if if you can get memory out of the way and be relaxed about what you're saying, then you're relaxed. You're already a better actor because you're relaxed, right? I mean, nothing's worse than watching a nervous actor because it's literally like watching someone juggle a bunch of porcelain vases 
and you like oh, don't drop it. It's gonna drop. It's gonna drop. <laughs> it's dropping. It's, it's dropping. You know. <laughs> oh, you're dropping. Oh, you're, you're dropping. You're paying attention to the wrong things. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're worried about the it's, crash. And it's like when you it's like when you sit in the audition room, which I've been on the other side of the table, and you watch actors come in and they're really nervous. You're just like you're nervous now. You know, you're like you're making me nervous. Oh, please don't. Oh, yeah, you're oh, nervous for them. For them, you know, and you're like oh, oh, oh you know, and and then it. And, and you see them sweating and you see them nervous. And so you're not thinking about the work anymore. But if you see a guy come in and he goes, what are you going to do? I'm going to do a bit from Death of a Salesman, you know, and he, and he boom, he starts nailing and he's all relaxed. And he's like, he's, wow, he's in character. Like, it's amazing. Like, you know, he may not be, he may be doing something completely different, but what you're reading as the audience is something very different. You're reading a relaxed guy mm-hmm. using these words. And so you believe what he's saying, right? But if he came in with Biff and he was just like, um, you know, um, um, and you know, you're like, oh, thank you, man. Thanks. Next. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you're like, hey, thanks, buddy. I'll take Those the are the worst the fucking words for an actor now. for an actor to hear. <laughs> oh, yeah. thanks, man. Yeah. Next. Thanks. thanks man. That was, we'll be in touch. That was good, man. That was no, that the was best great. is uh, when they say that without even looking up from the paper. Oh, like, oh. Okay, or better yet, you know, you want me to do it? Again? I can do. Can I do it again for you guys? No, nah, we're good. No, nah, we're good. Thanks. We're good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you guys must have some cringeworthy audition stories. Oh, there used to be a guy. I won't. I won't say his name. I mean, he's he's well known. His name was Chuck Billowitz. No, his name was Barry Moss. He passed away actually. Fuck him then. I mean, what? Yeah, <laughs> he was a casting director, and he used to have a pencil, and he was known for being an asshole to actors. And when I first experienced it, I was like, Oh my god, am I that bad? And he would grab a. As you were doing your work, he would have his head down, and he would roll the pencil. Back and forth, so you would hear this pencil going. <laughs> the fuck, and you man. and you would literally watch this guy with his head down, not even looking up at you, and you would finish. You say thank you, and you're like, you kind of feel violated, like you felt like you were just, like, dude, the fuck, man, like, did you yeah. have the true definition of zero fucks given? Yeah, like, like, <laughs> did you have to roll the? Pe- I mean, like, you don't, you don't have to like me. Did you have to roll the pencil? Why like, is he? Why are you in this business? I would ask him. Because there are a lot. There's a lot of people who are in the business who are, you know, actors who are. They're not acting anymore, and they want to stay in the business, but they they're, they they feel they're pissed off about it. Or who knows, man? Yeah, he's yeah. just so fucking miserable. Hang but, yourself. Yeah, that fucking pencil. How about I stab you in the fucking eye with that pencil? You piece of shit. I bring my brother-in-law here, John. He'll throat fuck you in front of all your friends with that fucking pencil. How's that sound? Now, if piece I would shit, that's what I, I was going to say. Rest in peace. But now you can hang yourself and rest in not in peace. <laughs> And Barry Sosselman, like, whatever you, the fuck uh, his name he's is. He's like, are you available for the dates? Because you're cast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you're you, in, thank TJ. And I'm like, oh, thank you. I you're do the, the thing only, with my you're hands. You're the only person who the, ever addressed the pencil. The, I've been doing this for years because <laughs> I wanted somebody to say, why the fuck are you rolling you the do pencil? The appreciative you got act, it, man. The appreciative actor thing with your yeah, hands like you your prank. It. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Namaste. You know, what I felt and, in the uh, moment was just a deep sense of anger. So I could tell you a great Alec Baldwin story. And it's true. Go ahead, do it because my wife keeps calling me, and I don't know what it is. Yeah, and we should probably wrap this up. I'm no, whatever you want. Yeah, I'll, no, I'll, no, keep going. I'm going to tell this story, and then I'm, then we're going to wrap up. Because I, I, that's awesome. This podcast is going to get viral. I really uh, wish I could grab the mic right now and just kind of stick it right, slide it over there. Yeah, that'd be that'd be awesome. It, it won't reach. What would be great? Let's lift the table. What, <laughs> what would be great if we put it over there and we, he heard him going. Oh my god, I'm fucking with Afrim again and fucking Doug and this guy. I don't know what he's doing. Yeah, I gotta here. just get me the fuck out of here. Just if you can, just, can you send me a text that <laughs> send says me a text that says, "Oh, something's going on. I, I gotta get out I, of here." I don't like any of them. I just fucking, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. <laughs> no, yeah. so I, I um, I auditioned for the Alec. So Alec Baldwin, before he became his second version of his career, you know, like ten years ago, post Shadow. Yeah, before. <laughs> yeah, no, before before um. 30 Rock, he like, um, he, you know, his career was kind of on the down, right? And it was, it was kind of done, you know? So he used to do, he used to teach acting, advanced acting classes up in the Hamptons and he had auditions for them. And I was doing Over Mice and Men and someone told me about him. And I was like, I would love to do that. So I went and auditioned for him. I signed up to audition. I was accepted. And just like everything else in this business, enough, nothing is easy. So of course, on the day of my audition, I got cast in a fucking under five fucking soap popper yeah yeah you know and I was a young fucking you can't throw those opportunities out obviously no yeah. young fucking desperate actor that needed work needed to book something something and so I said yes and so I was like oh fuck what do I do and I had done uh, extra work on under five I mean under on, on soap so I understood what the process was and a lot of times in soaps you know they don't shoot them anymore but back then you, you, you would you would wait all a long time before you went on 
and it was really nine to five. And so I was on guide and light. <laughs> Forget anybody here. I'm gonna, they're going to like, <laughs> yeah, you fucker. So I was on guide and light and I was scheduled to audition for Alec Baldwin. And I remember, so I went up and I had been on the set before for, as an extra and uh, I knew the costume designer and I said, Hey, his name was uh, Mickey. I think it was Mickey. And he's, I said, Hey, when am I scheduled to shoot that scene? And so back in soap operas, they literally, they had the shot list literally on the costume wall, mainly for the leads. Cause the leads wanted to know if they can go fucking go to the, go sleep or go yeah, eat. Yeah. They want to know what was up for them. So if you knew you were in the hospital scene with, you know, whoever the lead was, um, you would look on the list and you'd say, Oh, okay. It's, it's after lunch. Right. So I knew that my scene was going to be shot after lunch. But of course, if you're an under five or an extra, they don't give you that privilege. You have to be on the set like at nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah. 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 They want you there all day. Cause they want to make sure they control you. So I was like, fuck. And lunches always were an hour, sometimes even more. And, um, I was like, I was on I was on 66th Street. I was on the Upper West Side, and Alec Baldwin was doing auditions on NYU, which is on fucking complete opposite side of Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I'm gonna sneak out. So I basically oh. started sneaking. So I snuck. And, and let me tell you, man, if you get caught as an under oh, five no, actor man. sneaking off set on an extra, and You're they call out, it, man. Dude, you will never work in soap again. Oh shit, there's no more soaps. But you would never work in soap again. Like you would be. In ostracized your, ostr in your mind Go fuck yourself in your mind you thought you literally had raped someone I mean like you'd be like <laughs> they they would they would destroy you're like you. about to rob a, a bank essentially that's the emotions like you're like probably sweating thinking like yo I can I can get there and come back in time and nobody will know dude you hit it on the head I was so <laughs> nervous I was like I, a young man nervous like I just robbed a bank and so I walked out and I was I remember I, I was in an orderly that was my costume so I took off my orderly I put on my clothes and I, <laughs> I took off my orderly and I, and I and I walked out was out of the elevator through the lobby and I was praying that the security guy go hey uh, where are you going you know and didn't, didn't say a word to me I got in a cab I told the guy dude I need you to get to NYU as fast as you can so he like hauled he hauled ass on the west side and he got me there like in blazing time right and I was like oh great you know I tipped him I go up, to, I go up to the space, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a nervous wreck, right? Like I'm not in the right state of mind to audition. Well, yeah. Cause you're also just like doing something that you know, you're not really supposed to be. And the whole time you're thinking about like, if I get caught in this, I will never work in this business ever again. And so <laughs> I, I go up, you know, and, and I see the list, you know, and there's like people waiting. And I remember this girl and I said, listen, I'm scheduled to audition. It, like later in the day is there any way that I could go now and um, I I have to get back and I didn't want to tell him that I was basically I went AWOL on a fucking set yeah so uh, she goes uh, let me ask Alec and let me ask um, the 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 moderator and we'll see I'll get back to you so she goes inside she comes in she goes Alex says if you're ready to go now you can go now if this girl says you can go she goes, yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, you can go. She was like, good luck, dude. You know, whatever you're going to do in there. And so I go. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, when I went in, I did not know Alec Baldwin was going to be in there. So the monologue I picked of all the fucking monologues was his. Was Stanley and Streetcar. Ah. <laughs> So I walk in, I walk in the room and I'm like, I'm going to do Stanley, you know, he's my kind of guy. And I see, oh my God, it's Alec Baldwin's in the fucking room. He did Stanley and Broadway. He, he, like, I'm so like, as if you somehow couldn't get more nervous, the the world was like, ah, that's unbelievable. Here you, here you go. Which one was Stanley? Marlon Brando? Yeah. I could have been a contender? You that's the speed. That's the monologue? No, the contender's from the movie. Uh, yeah. The, on the uh, waterfront. Water all right, whatever but it same is. Actor. No, I'm saying yeah. I'm really adept at a lot of stuff that you're talking about. So go ahead. So I go in. <laughs> I sat down. <laughs> and he you says, see the elements of shit that's going on in this room right and, now. And he says, he says, um, so you know, hey, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do for us? Oh man! And I said, um, Big Bird. So, no, I, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> uh, nothing actually. I just wanted to say hi. Um, I said, no, I'm gonna do Stanley from Streetcar. And and true to his credit, he goes, Oh, I love it. I love it. Let's do it. And I was like, Yeah, like there shouldn't be anything wrong with doing it, but obviously you're with the person who spends. You want to probably that's bring an element of new that's to an element family. of coolness on his part. Yeah, yeah. Who did I it on think. Broadway? Who did it on Broadway? Yeah, and I, he, I let him do it. I, I was busy. Yeah, and so I, uh, I started <laughs> the monologue, time. and I, my mind was just like so racing. I went blank. I forgot the fucking lines, and I was. I started the monologue, and I went. 
Uh, a friend is cringing right now. <laughs> he just because we've been there, man. I, yeah. I was like, oh, I fucking can't remember the lines. And he goes, just look at me. And then, and, and it kept fucking with me. He goes, look at me and do the monologue. And I was like, I, I can't look at you right now. It's like you're freaking me out. Like I'm looking at Alec Baldwin right now. Like this, I shouldn't be looking at Alec Baldwin doing Stanley right now. And he's like, just look at me. Just look at me. And he kept it was really intense, like like Alec Baldwin. And I finally got so frustrated. I said, damn it. And I threw the chair across the room and he was like all right i like that he goes go get the chair come back and i was i literally th- i i was basically saying fuck it like this is phenomenal like, like i like i i have just imploded right in front of alec baldwin and i might as well do it i'm just gonna implode like the athlete i was from texas like, my I'm, man I'm play just, angry bro i'm just play like, angry i threw her the chair and then <clears throat> i once i knew that he was okay he goes like just sit down i want you to do it in the chair now let's go. Where, where are you at? And, and we, he started kind of coaxing me into it, and I started getting into it and getting into it. And then I finally got through it. It wasn't any good. And I, he, then him and the guy who was holding the, the auditions in there was like, they got on a on a conversation about you know what well, what Stanley really loves. You know, and they went back and forth. He's like, well, what do you think? Why why does who does Stanley really love in the play? And there was all these different opinions, you know. He goes, no, he loves Blanche. It's all about Blanche. He, you know, and he was getting really into it. And, you know, if people don't know Alec Baldwin, people, you know, I know he's become kind of a character, but the guy is incredibly intelligent. I mean, he's... he's oh, he's incredible. He's one man. of the last real, like, all-around guys, a, in in my opinion, in acting and theater. Like, he, he could be, you know, he's aware... And, and like, he, if you ever listen to his podcast, he's almost like a vaudevillian but also uh, a Shakespearean and, and also and, and a, know, a contemporary actor he's got a little bit of everything and he's wicked wicked smart wicked sharp he's sharp as hell man you know I don't I don't really watch it's, a lot it, of it's television almost, it's almost dangerous how wicked he is I don't watch a lot of television but when 30 Rock was on anytime if I flip through the channels and his face is on I stop and like 10 different times he's doing these fucking quick witted like rapid fire the way he does things and that's the way he was and so he's so smart man so i he i got in the class i fucking made it in the class and when i got the email that i was in i couldn't fucking believe it i was like did you get back to the fucking so, soap yeah, opera i was like now because that you know. fuck the class did you get back to the soap so, opera? so what was crazy is so i get out i was Demoralized. God damn it, he loves you, man. I was demoralized. I was well, like, yeah, because obviously he didn't, on, know, sorry, it. He didn't the, know it. No, he I, didn't know I, at this point that he but, got but it. When I went to the, I didn't to, know. When I went to go talk to my wife and P in the bathroom, um, I thought this was a, an audition to be in a show, but it's f- for a class that he was teaching. Yeah, he, uh, he, before he became like his second burst of his career, before he became really big, big again, I love that, Thirty man. Rock. He was teaching at a, a, a class, and he'd been doing it for a while at the Hamptons. Uh, advanced scene study class so anyhow i left demoralized i thought i blown i was like not only did i walk off set i just blew up in front i just blew up i used to keep a diary then i literally have it in there i just blew up in front of alec baldwin how you like that i just i just literally i just imploded like someone how just, do you like that i just i just like you know as an actor i then, just threw a chair in the room as an actor then you're literally thinking some people say how was your acting career well my highlight was when i threw a chair in front of alec baldwin you gotta um, love that he. You gotta love that he accepted him, and he had to love the fucking raw, honest emotion that he appreciated in him at that. Well, he moment. probably saw what was going on, and, yeah. they, and they had a discussion. And he's it, an it actor. Wasn't, it, yeah, exactly. It was an actor doing it, that versus having the the audition process. Robot. The guys. Uh, he'd be like, uh, you know, he does it. Sit him down, have him do it. Be like, okay, thank you. You know, we'll see yeah. you. That's I'll it. Tell you versus what, having the discussion. What, what it really proved ultimately is that he cares. Yeah. That he fucking cares. Oh no, you know? he, and and so I got into cab, and then on the way back, it was like. Oh, like everything. Tra- oh, the traffic was so slow. I remember going, "Oh my god!" <laughs> it's just like you're how, sit, far, you're how, far away, how far away was uh, it? The CBS is on it, to this day. It's still there. It's on uh, 66 and almost basically yeah. the West Side. Yeah, and NYU. It's on <laughs> yeah, NYU Street. is on Eighth so Street. Right? Fucking diagonal <laughs> across of, of the island. And I was like, "Oh my!" And every time we hit traffic, and you it's know, just, I, and that, at that like, time, Fuck it. like I should have just jumped in the subway, right? And you, you think at that time. That, you know, cab is always faster. No, but it's going to be faster, you think. Yeah, yeah it's, it's never faster. Mayhem, yep. It's never faster. I Anyway, long as I get back to the studio, I literally walk by really fast by the security guy, hit the elevator buttons, because I was hoping he didn't stop me, fling up, you know. I get all the way up, and I'm trying to think, was that before 9-11? No, it was right after 9-11. But things weren't, I think, 
I can't remember. Uh, no, it was after 9-11. Yeah, it was after 9-11. And uh, so I now I get in there and I fucking, I am, dude, I am so, every step I take up in that studio and that lot said, so if you don't know, and anybody who's never been on soaps or the way they, they usually, they would film them in a warehouse. Yep. So basically it was a warehouse and they would divide the warehouse into, you know. And they have that camera that just moves from scene to scene. Exactly. It's that, just fucking on a track and yeah, it just goes to the next yeah, fucking that's, scene. That's why they're so efficient. They can shoot. They can shoot a whole series yeah. in one day. Yeah. So they go from the kitchen to the bathroom yeah. to whatever whatever the plot of the of that soap is, you know, and they would and they would go plot, 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 plot everywhere. And I literally as I'm walking up and I'm in the costume, I'm waiting for someone to go, excuse where the me. Fuck have where you the been? fuck have you been? Get off set. Get away. Yeah, exactly. We will be escorting you out right now <laughs> and you not allowed to act in New York again, ever again. And um, dude, no, dude, they were running late. And of course, and they were running. Of course, late. that's what I thought in my they head. Were, I was they like, were, they don't even know. They don't even know. And I got dressed, and I was like miserable. And How they, long do I have to wait here? When is my scene? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for five minutes. You know, <laughs> right. I think but I the, the heart pounding of every step you're taking up oh. to get there to get because I've been in that. I've been in those types of scenarios too. Where you're like, I just really was cutting it so close to try to fit. You know, work like three different things in in a day from an audition to I work know. to this, and then you get there and you're like, I'm never gonna do this job again <laughs> uh, friend, yeah. do you have any stories like crazy audition stories I know you have a lot of them I do but we'll share them on no, the next episode I don't episode. want to share them this is it this is the episode I have no time limit in my head I want yeah. you to know that yeah, unless I, you do I do I have to end it now oh, because... so go fuck yourself bro no. <laughs> <laughs> why would you do that bro I, bro I've been, I've been here so like fucking I've been here literally three and a half hours yeah so Man, let's start the show we, that's how we yeah, do it let's start the show oh yeah hit record and, and I think out of the three and a half hours we've talked about the American soldier maybe ten minutes yeah but it's funny though. I have no butt for that. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. We did. We talked an hour and a half. I want to come back here when we're drinking bourbon, bro. I had three beers we'll already, so we'll look it up. We'll I, I it really want to do that. We'll do a full. If you we want, we really do a full need, out just, three PLT episode. We need a three PLT episode. But you know, so fucking just, bad. Just to show you how crazy this business is, the person who I took that workshop with is the person who recommended Patrick to me. Oh wow! So. She started a theater company. It's not in existence anymore. But so when I was like in desperate mode, that's pretty cool. When I searched out, I said, "Do you know any?" This, I reached out. So I tell people always ask whenever you're trying to create something, you need help. Ask as many people as you can because you don't know where the yes is going to come from. Yeah. And when and even when they tell you no, ask them, "Do you know somebody who would say yes?" And so and I got a lot of no's. And I said, "Do you know anybody?" who would be interested in a project like this. She goes, well, I don't know if anybody's interested, but I know a guy who does a lot of solo shows and he's really good at them. His name is Patrick Lillis. And that's how I got Patrick from a girl named Danielle Masterpony. Uh, and ultimately, girl. the real life changer is that through Patrick, you met me. It is. And that's, and so when I, and when I get on another podcast 10 years from now and they say, how do you know TJ? So let me tell you an Alec Baldwin story. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. what happens, TJ. You, yeah. you, you, you met me through Alec Baldwin. Yeah. You climbed the mountain and you... He met me through Alec Baldwin. Yeah, yeah. and I started yeah. telling Alec Baldwin and then I met Patrick and then pa AB. Patrick, I call him AB. I met um, TJ. AB and I, you know, it's so funny. It's funny. Well, he used to have a production called AB Productions. Well, yeah, that's um, I, I named it. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Where do you have to go? You just have to get the fuck out of here, right? No, I have you don't to, have to give me a specific well, location. I have to leave. I get it. I have to leave. Three and a half hours with me, I'd want to hang myself. <laughs> no, I have to leave. I have to go meet my wife and kids. So she's in the city. I told her I meet her at two o'clock. Oh, right really? Now, she, she just called me. She good just, luck. She just called me. And she, I, I know she left me a voicemail. It's not a good one. It's not a good one. It's, what is she doing in the city? Uh, she. Well, she went to work with the kids because the kids are off from school. Oh, really? Yeah, they're what off. What the fuck are they doing? Oh, Jersey. It's a Jersey thing. It's a Thanksgiving th Jersey yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, they're already off. So any uh, any info you want to put out about the American soldier dates? Yeah. Uh, stuff you want to mention? So if you can, sh if if you li if anybody's listening to this. Very good, Ephraim. Any, no problem. I told him to I ask got, you that I, again. <laughs> I like Ephraim. We, I oh, come he's back the man. He's, he's very, the man. he's the best. He's the best. He Bro, is. Three PLT is me and him now. Fuck everybody else. I want to come back. They all suck. I want to come back, but I only want to come back. When him, because he's the buoy to us, dude. Or, or me and him start talking about football and freaking. Oh, we're fucking ra raging. You know what we became, right? We became locker room jocks yeah. when we were together yeah. alone. Everyone, every we're like, yeah, bro, fucking. <laughs> every woman who listens to this podcast just basically blocked us. Blocked us or got a little wet in their pants. <laughs> yeah. 
Jesus. That's what we say in the locker room. So it's locker room talk. So if you want to hear the American soldier, if you- <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just the two back to back. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's let's re- let's restart that. So just in case oh, we need a sound bite. Okay. So if there's anything about the American, American soldier, soldier you'd like to tell, uh, anyone just reminded me of right me now. and Jamie under. Ah, shit! I told you I wasn't going to say her name oh, underneath no. the bleachers. I used to finger her. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. The American Soldier, anything you'd like? <laughs> At first taste of a November. Giant, great, fellas. <laughs> Look, both of you, I fucked both of your brains up. Uh, Don't tell me he's a buoy. I will unbuoy the fuck out of this. Look, you're sniffing for it. <laughs> well, listen, the uh, the buoy cannot compete with the ocean. It's only uh, man, there. Sometimes a girl makes me want to just jerk off in the corner of a hotel room while they watch. Let me grab the potted huh? plant. <laughs> I just, I never, I never, I I mean, I still don't ever get it. I won't ever get it. Even, I know it's a compulsion, but it's a weird one. You know, it's fun. You know, the only thing that stuck out to me was potted plant because I'm thinking how, how else would you have a plant in a hotel room? It wouldn't be unpotted. You know what I mean, fellas? mm -hmm. From time to time, I'll be injecting comedy like that. Those funny (laughs) one liners and stuff. All right, anyway, go ahead. So, no, so, so uh, the American soldier, anything American soldier. that uh, you want to share and I'm doing let it people know about? At the IRT <coughs> Solo Show Festival, November 30th. Dude, we'll be there. And December 2nd, 7 p.m. Farm Theater? Uh, they're co-producing it with another co- theater company called Stable Company. Uh, Stable Lab. Do you know that kid Lee that was in here the other day, Lee Kaplan? So I don't know him per se. We only know each other like through social media and virtually. And nice kid. Oh, and, yeah, and also because... Patrick directed us both, but yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. Um, I've never done anything with him, so it'd be yeah. interesting. I mean, it's a it's a play about bullying, uh, the American soldier, and and PT and uh, suicide. So it's going to be a really uplifting, a lot of, a lot of fun. You yeah. and I should do a two man show together, bro. I think we, I think we <laughs> called doors, <laughs> doors to nowhere, called doors to nothing, to nowhere. <laughs> All right, bro. Website, some other shit. Yeah, www.theamericansoldiersoloshow.com. Look at you. Hit, hit Very up, handsome. Look. Hit me up on Look, Twitter. I got, your, I got your website right here. Look at that. Yeah. Don't get wet. That's how I do my uh, my uh, the search, my uh, <laughs> research. Like, he's like, <laughs> we'll hit up all your info in the show notes, so anyone listening right now they yeah. can check it out and see what's yeah. going on next. He's come, in the zone, edgy and adrenaline fueled. Yeah, come come see the show, man. And then if you ha- um um just you know sign up for the newsletter, I'll let you know when I'm doing it again. Um, but uh, this has been a blast. I thought I was going to come here talk for about 30 minutes about my show and plug it. Next thing you know, I'm talking about everything, and I don't think I have a wife anymore. God bless you. Congratulations. Yes, I know. Someone told me that. <laughs> I, 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 someone told me that I'm getting divorced, and I said that, and his wife did not appreciate uh, the, his, uh, the girl I was with. My wife's friend, she goes, that's not very nice. Well, and I said, more than likely, what? I said, she goes, I'm, I think I'm getting a divorce. I said, dude, that's... Congratulations! That's awesome. That's awesome, dude. And, and, and here's to the next uh, yeah. step of your life. Yeah, yeah. yeah, man. I mean, I tell people that, and they're like, "Cause I always tell people, you know, girls get married, guys say yes." And when I tell that story to a girl, man, they it, it really does drop like a thud. Like, well, they, it, they they don't they don't find it funny at all. I think it's funny, but they are like. Well, listen, we are a, well, we are a bastion of offbeat humor here. Yeah, well, <laughs> you got to that, that's nothing. We'll get you drunk and get your real feelings going. Anyhow, um, I appreciate it, guys. One closing thought, fun. the woman who who got upset for you saying that is a cunt. Oh. 3 PLT interviews. 3 PLT <laughs> the interviews with, with Doug Torrell. TJ Torrell Stone and Afrim Jambalai. And the only time yourself. I'll actually say the name correctly. Jambalai, all right? Yeah. Awesome. I'm cutting that out. Bye. Peace. Peace. Thank you, veterans. This has been Three People Like This Interviews with TJ Stone. Look up to yeah. Well, hold up, hold up. Said so you need to get a hold of your pride. Set up in the bottom of the bed. So you need to get a hold of yourself. Yeah. Well, you see me, believe me. I'm about to make you look up to yeah. But the one thing they always talking about, yeah, the one thing they always know, they always turn to me.
make it look on strong But the one thing they always talking about You yeah, know one thing they always know They always stand Me They always stand at 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 me Oh, 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 oh Time walks 